Welcome to the All Things Nintendo podcast. I'm Brian Shea from Game Informer, and this is a weekly podcast to discuss all the biggest news and games from the world of Nintendo. It is another week where we're starting with just me, but later we will be joined by one of my favorite people in the entire industry, host extraordinaire, and a person who has a Nintendo show of her own, Trisha Hirschberger. But for now, we're just going to kick things off with a few listener questions. You know, I've been telling you that I've wanted to do this. I've wanted to make this show more interactive and have uh, more listener involvement. And here we are. I want to have, I guess we have time for about three questions this time around. And uh, so we're going to kick it off with some questions. But as a reminder, there are several ways to get me questions, topics, whatever for the show. But the primary avenues are through the show's free Patreon page, which you can find by searching All Things Nintendo on Patreon, or by going to patreon.com slash Brian Shea Podcasts, or by emailing me at brian at allthingsnintendo.com. So like I mentioned, we have a few questions to get through this, uh, this episode. So the first one comes to us via Patreon. Uh, so glad to see this show got a one-up mushroom. Here is my Nintendo-related inquiry. Do you cash in your Nintendo Platinum points? I spend most of mine on wallpaper backgrounds for my PC. I save the files to a folder I use as a slideshow, so the images rotate every few minutes to keep my desktop looking fresh. I've been doing this since 2017, so I've built up a very large library of images. How do you use this point? How do you use these points? And if you don't use them, they will expire. This is from Ian T. Clark on Patreon. So yeah, I mean, I try to redeem my points. I think that the platinum points, so there's the platinum and the gold points. The, the platinum points you can use on my Nintendo, and uh, f- which was previously known as Club Nintendo. And the gold points, I believe, are for the discounts on games. So like if you buy a game, you get a set number of gold points, and then those can be used for like a discount on a game that you buy in the future on the eShop. So I always use those as soon as I can. The platinum points, if I'm not mistaken, you can use those to also get the icons on the Switch Online. So uh, I will do that a lot, honestly. Like I will go on and I'll check like every few weeks to see what games are being featured. If it's something like Super Mario World, I'll probably buy all of them because it's one of my favorite games. Uh, if it's Animal Crossing, I'll usually buy just like the weirdos, the <laughs> the ones that like... If I were to ever make an icon, it would probably make somebody laugh. I don't really change my icon up that much, which is the funny thing about this whole situation, because I don't really have a lot of variance in my... I think I've changed my Switch icon like maybe four times over the course of its entire console life. Like it's it's usually been something Zelda related. I think I have had one where it was just Mario riding Yoshi... But for the most part, it's been either Ocarina of Time Link, Breath of the Wild Link, or Tears of the Kingdom Link. I think right now it is Tears of the Kingdom Link as my Switch icon. But yeah, it's been um, that, that's been my primary use of it. Every once in a while, I'll find something good on the uh, the My Nintendo Shop, and I've gotten things like the Super Smash Brothers envelopes. Like they, they sent like little cards that you could send out to people with the Super Smash Brothers envelope, and then there was. A, I think I even have it within arm's distance here, but it's basically like the the invitation that the characters get when they're invited to join the Smash Brothers roster. Hold on one second. Let me see if I can find this. Yeah. So, you know, the sticker's kind of fallen off. It's not the it's not like the stamp that is supposed to be, but if you're watching the video version, you can see right now, it's just like a little card with an envelope, and I just kind of like that to put in my display case alongside the uh kind of the the amiibos that i have that are spanning the various uh franchises and and companies so i have like all these different display cases with zelda and mario and pokemon and overwatch which unfortunately i might need to change that out in name of giving it to something else but yeah so that's usually what i use my platinum points for and as ent clark points out they do expire if you don't use them and same thing for the gold points i believe as well but yeah i really like that idea of having kind of like a rotating background i usually just have one background on my pc and on my phone but i like the idea of having it rotate um that's that's not a bad idea i i have redeemed the points for a really awesome i want to say it was breath of the wild background 
and uh, I had that as my PC background for a while. So yeah, that was uh, that, that's what I use my platinum points for. But the icons I feel like on Switch are the ones that I I use it the most, or at least think <laughs> I think the most often to go and cash them in. Um, but yeah, those gold points, those are the that's where it's really at because that's that'll save you the money. All right, next up, another one from Patreon. First, wanted to say that I've loved the podcast since you started. Thank you. Really enjoy hearing your expertise each and every week. Keep up the good work. Well, thank you. Second, I had a topic slash hypothetical question that I would love to hear your answer. Nintendo gives you a huge chunk of change and says, go find a developer for us to collaborate with. Who are you getting? What kind of game will they make? And what Nintendo IP are you using? I feel like everyone will have a different answer for this, but mine would have to be a Zelda roguelike made by Supergiant in the style of Hades. Thanks again for giving me a great listen each and every week, Drew. And this actually came in via email. Apologies. All right. So I have unlimited Nintendo money to make a game in the style that I want to make with the developer, like kind of licensing it out. So kind of thinking like Hyrule Warriors or Mario plus Rabbids. Um, man, that's a tough one. I, th I've pitched this one in the past, but I don't know who the developer would be, but a Zelda, and I'm kind of sticking with your idea, a Zelda roguelite where, but instead of being in the style of Hades, I guess it could be in the style of Hades, but a Zelda roguelite where you play the role of Ganon and each game or each each life that you have, you have to try to defeat Link and take over Hyrule. And then each time Link defeats you and you fail, you're reborn in a different form, in a different era, and most importantly, a different art style. So you may come into the world and, you know, it's Skyward Sword era and you have kind of that art style. And of course, this couldn't be canonical. It's more for, for fun. And then if Link defeats you, then it's a different era. And now, look, you're in like the Wind Waker art style. And you have to try to defeat Link in that era. And if you win, that's, you know, that that plunges Hyrule into an era of darkness. And then like you have to amass power and keep keep your rule going until the next Link is born or something like that. But I really, really like the idea of taking Link and or taking Ganon as the the main playable character and having him be reborn in different eras and different art styles throughout all this. I don't know who would make that, though. I guess Supergiant could make that. Um, I've also, uh, we, we talked about this on the show a little bit ago, but like having that quote where the Prince of Persia developer kind of hinted that they would want to make, or Prince of Persia, the Lost Crown specifically, that they would love to make like a Zelda 2 remake. That, man, that would be amazing. I would... I would love that. That would be incredible. And Nintendo already has a great relationship with Ubisoft, so that would be great. Uh, speaking of Ubisoft making a, a game from an established Nintendo IP, I mean, what's Nintendo doing with Star Fox? Nothing. They've shown that, like, they've struggled with that IP. They've given it to several different developers. Ubisoft already made a good Star Fox game with Starlink. Uh, obviously, it was only the Switch version or the what was it, Wii U at this point. I don't even remember. I think it was Switch. That, you know... Link or Link, um, Starlink had Star Fox in it if you played the Nintendo exclusive version. So that was one of the best Star Fox experiences since Star Fox 64. Why not just let Ubisoft take a crack at it? Good space combat. Um, you know, we recently revealed our cover story of Star Wars Outlaws that has space combat. It seems like they could do something with the Star Fox IP. And if Nintendo doesn't want to do it, have a, a third-party developer do it. Why not? And, man, another one that I could... I mean, the obvious answers are all like, all right, well, let, let the Dead Cells developers make a Metroidvania game with the Super Metro or uh, the Metroid license, right? But I feel like that's too obvious. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think of, like, indie developers that I really, really love and Nintendo IPs that are kind of underserved. Um... 
I don't want to, I don't want another developer to take Mario Kart. Cause I mean, cause that's the other thing is like, if a, a game or a franchise is coming off of an all time great entry, like I wouldn't be like, Oh, we need to give another developer animal crossing because we just got arguably the best animal crossing game. Same thing for Mario Kart. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is the best Mario Kart game. Why would we want a different developer to take it? But I think that those spinoff ideas, um, maybe, I don't know what developer it would be, but I would love like a Lego Mario game. We've seen a lot of licensed Lego games. And I think that if there was like a Lego platformer, almost combining like elements of a Mario game with elements of the Lego franchise and maybe like a Mario Maker Lite style mode where you can make your own levels through that. That would be a cool game. Um, I guess, man, who would even make that though? Um, I guess whoever makes the Lego games. I don't know. Traveler's Tales? Is that the, the, the company that makes it? Um, but yeah, I guess those are my answers. So Ubisoft making a Zelda 2 remake, Ubisoft making a Star Fox game, um, somebody, I guess maybe Supergiant, making that Ganon Zelda roguelite, and... Uh, I guess whatever the last one I said was the Lego Mario game. That's what it was. Okay. So yeah, good question. Thank you. And then we have one more coming in. Good afternoon. Long time listener to your show. Congrats on going independent. Thank you very much. My first Nintendo games were on N64 and I have so much nostalgia for those games, especially Ocarina of Time. And I still like playing those games. I'm currently working through Majora's Mask. My question is about older games. Most of these games are clunky slash unintuitive and not nearly as pretty to play as what is out now. What is it about playing older games that is so enjoyable? And why is it still fun to boot up N64 era games or arcade games like Dig Dug? This comes from Roan Parent via email. Hopefully I pronounced that name correctly. So I think a lot of it has to do with nostalgia, right? Like, I've heard people who never went back and or who never grew up or too young to have grown up with something like Ocarina of Time or one of my other favorites, Final Fantasy X, be like, oh, these games are so hard to play in 2024. And I get that because, you know, in that era, especially in like the Ocarina of Time, N64, even the PS1 era, most developers were still very much lost in the woods when it came to like the best practices of developing developing uh, like the movement mechanics of a 3d game by that point 2d gameplay was down pat like uh, you know mario world existed the sonic games existed mario 3 uh so many amazing 2d games the link to the past super metroid so many amazing 2d games they had figured out 2d game design by the time the n64 rolled around I think Super Mario 64 was almost like a Trojan horse in a lot of ways because people played that and they're like, oh, this is the future of gaming. And, you know, it was. But Mario 64 was so far ahead of the crowd, right? Like there was no game that felt as good as Mario 64 as far as 3D games are concerned. And that ultimately led to a lot of misfires. Every developer was basically trying to accomplish what Nintendo had accomplished with Mario 64 with their game. And a lot of them fell well short. So I think that nostalgia is a lot, a lot to do with that. And I mean, you look at Ocarina of Time, like some one of, one of the ones that this, this listener wrote in about, that's the game that really established all third party action titles uh, uh, to this day. Like the Z targeting is still a convention that is used everything from, uh, any, I mean, every third person action game. I mean, we had it in, uh, in Dark Souls. We have it in Elden Ring. You can lock onto a target and circle around and it keeps the camera locked on it. We have it in Breath of the Wild. It's just the target lock. That was what Z targeting pioneered. So every like third party action or third person action game has followed Ocarina of Time. So some of those elements have aged extremely well. I, Ocarina of Time is one of my favorite games of all time. I'll fully admit that there are certain parts that have not aged particularly well. And as somebody who recently uh, played Majora's Mask for the first time, even though that's a direct sequel to Ocarina of Time, it didn't have the same impact on me playing it in 2023 as it would have if I played it back in uh, 
what was it, 2000 that that game came out. So nostalgia definitely has a huge part of part in that. Now, as for like arcade games like Dig Dug, I mean, you could say a lot of that is simplicity. Like those games are meant to you immediately recognize what your objective is, what you're supposed to do, and then it, you have all the tools to do it, or you can find power ups to let you do those tools. And that simplicity is designed to get you to replay it over and over again. I mean, same thing with the difficulty. There's a reason those arcade games are so maddeningly difficult. It's the same reason so many mobile games today have difficulty spikes that make you get a taste of victory, but just enough that you want to buy extra lives. I mean, that's basically what the arcade would do. You get into a brawler, like a like TMNT arcade or uh, X-Men arcade, and you get through that first level. You'd be like, wow, that was so much fun. That was great. And then you get to like the second or third level and it's just punishingly difficult, but you remember how good that feeling of victory was. So what do you do? You put in extra quarters or you you buy extra lives on the, the app store and it lets you keep playing and chasing that that feeling. And I think that's why our, the old school arcade games are so good at being replayable. It's because they're, they're simple. And once they had established the best practices for 2D gameplay in a, a series like Dig Dug or Pac-Man, it was it was really transformative for making the experience that much better. So, I mean, I think that's a big part of it. And of course, like some of the games that you mentioned, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, Dig Dug, I'd argue that th those three games are probably among the top 100 games of all time. So there's something to be said about that and just having genius design. Whereas if you go back today and try to play like an old, like, not to crap all over one of the franchises, but like Bubsy or Gex or something like that. Like you'll see how big that gap was, especially in 3D level design and, and control mechanics and everything. I think that that is a really important piece of the puzzle that uh, really contributes to why those games are so infinitely replayable. So, I mean, I'm with you. I will be talking about this later on in the episode, but um, retro games are a big theme on this episode, and we'll be talking a lot about that. And one of the reasons that they are that way is because you can feel nostalgic. You can recapture those feelings from when you were younger while also getting that simplicity and that ease of entry, right? Like sometimes I fire up my Xbox or my Switch or my PlayStation, and I'm like, what do I want to play? And I'll be like, do I want to start that RPG? where I'll have to like sit through like long tutorials and and have to like figure out some way to like endure the first hour or two without like any real action or do I just want to jump into a Mario level where like I will be dumped right into the fun and of course like you know some of my favorite games of all time are RPGs that have tutorial heavy sequences but sometimes I'm just in the mood to to jump right into the action and I think that that's what something like dig dug does for you it's like you get the little jingle and then you're off to the races and uh yeah i think that's a large contributing factor but thank you all so much for questions and we didn't get to everything i i have saved any questions i haven't gotten to yet in a document so try to continue chipping away but if you would like to get any questions in or topics for that matter, I have a great topic suggestion from Megan S on Patreon that I'm going to try to do in a future episode. But if you want to get any questions or comments in for future episodes, you can hit me up on Patreon or email me at brian at allthingsnintendo.com. But for now, we're going to take our first break. And when I come back, I will be joined by this week's guest. We will be right back. We are back, and I am now joined by a longtime host from, God, so many places. But currently, she is the host of Nintendo Weekly and a Twitch streamer extraordinaire, Trisha Hirschberger. Trisha, how are you today? I'm so good. Thank you so much for having me. This is so awesome. Yeah, it's been really an interesting way that we've gotten to know each other because, like, I think our first time actually meeting was during a Tears of the Kingdom event around this time last year. I mean, it, this was like in the lead up to launch. It was like the yes. only hands on thing that they did. And we just like struck up conversation while we were like desperately waiting for Nintendo to let us get our hands on the Switch that had Tears of the Kingdom running. That's and uh, 
I'm so grateful that we struck up that conversation as well, because let me tell you how nerve wracking it can be at those events, because like media professionals such as yourself get to go to these things very often, right? You already know each other. You're making small talk with each other. And then there's someone like me who typically comes at this from like the um, the more entertainment angle. Mm -hmm. I don't know any of these people. And I also feel like sometimes there's, even though media and content creators, we should be all one big happy family. I do feel like sometimes there's a, a bit of a separation there in the expectations of how we're going to be at events, how we're going to cover events, et cetera. So I I felt a little bit like the odd kid in the room. So I really appreciate you being so lovely uh, to strike up small talk with me there. And I believe you had an amazing link tunic dress on. I did. Yes. Yes. I had a breath of the (laughs) wild tunic dress on Um, because, you know, when one gets invited to check out tears of the kingdom early, you dress for the occasion. Oh, absolutely. And then since then, we've run into each other at Nintendo Live back in, uh, what was that, last August? And then uh, it was either late August, early September, and that was out in Seattle. And then uh, the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth event out in L.A. So we've uh, just, by complete coincidence, run into each other, cross paths. And every time we're like, we should do something together. We should record something together. We should collaborate. And here we are. It's finally happening. And we're doing it two times in one week because... Uh, people who are listening to this when it comes out uh, this morning, I actually was on Trisha's show, Nintendo Weekly. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you archive those those videos? They are archived. So Nintendo Weekly airs on both Twitch and Amazon Live, which everyone listening is probably like, Amazon Live, what? <laughs> Amazon has a live streaming platform in addition to Twitch. It's confusing because Amazon also owns Twitch. But they have another live streaming platform called Amazon Live, which is more of, uh, it's meant for more shoppable live streams. But because you can buy Nintendo things there, uh, just, you know, in addition to hardware and software, you can also buy merchandise and plushies and amiibos and fun little accessories. So I like to dual stream that show in both places so that all of the viewers on Twitch who are like, oh my gosh, I need that. Where'd you get it? Well, funny enough, you can watch the show in two places simultaneously and get all that information. So it works out well. But yeah, Nintendo Weekly is a relatively new show as well. We Mm -hmm. are only a couple months into the Nintendo Weekly at this point. It's about maybe two and a half months running, so still pretty new. Yeah, so definitely go check out this week's episode in the archive. Uh, As I mentioned, I was the guest this week, so we have not recorded it yet. We're recording this the night before that appearance, so I'm sure we had a great time, though. I'm sure it was just (laughs) the best show ever. So if you uh, finish this episode and you're like, wow, I really would like to hear more of these two talking about Nintendo... We've got some good news for you. But before we dive into the news this week, Trisha, we have a time-honored tradition for all debuting guests. It is a way that we can get to know you through the lens of Nintendo. It is first Nintendo game, favorite Nintendo game. So the first part of that question, Trisha, is just basically how did you get started in having this love of Nintendo or Nintendo games or products or consoles? Anything that is like an early memory for you with Nintendo stuff? I feel like my answer is probably the same of many friends of our generation. That first Nintendo game has got to go to that Super Mario Brothers Duck Hunt combo cartridge. Oh, yes. On the original NES. Um, And so for me, I am the oldest of, I only have one other sibling, but I'm the elder sibling, if you will. And I had a neighbor. Her name was Joy, and Joy had the original NES at her house, and she only had that one combo cartridge that came with it. And I played Duck Hunt at her house, and I thought I tried to be cool and hang and play Super Mario Brothers, but I was not good at it because I didn't own I didn't own any video game system at this point. Um, but I was like, you know, I'm getting better at Duck Hunt the more I play at Joy's house, and so I begged and pleaded and asked my parents for a Nintendo Entertainment console, uh, and they were very like more traditional and very like well darling that's for boys because that's what it was marketed to at the time and that's the aisle it was in at the toy store and i was like cool 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 can i get one though (laughs) neat neat though i'd really like one um and so eventually i got my own nes console took after years of pleading um and then it came with that super mario brothers duck hunt cartridge so that was my first ever owned game and my first ever experienced game at someone else's. And let me tell you, as soon as I owned that cartridge, 
I was like, duck hunt out of the way. It's all Mario time. And I got good as they say. <laughs> so what, what games did you go to from there? Do you remember like the next cartridges that you bought? Uh, well, I didn't buy them because I was so young. Oh, yeah. But so next they were, like, you acquired. My, <laughs> right, my Christmas presents, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, I got like one Nintendo cartridge a year for Christmas because that was the big gift, right? And yeah. then because I kind of came into the NES right around the time that all the cool kids were starting to get the Super NES, I got to benefit from the numerous garage sales. Oh. where everyone was unloading their NES cartridges to make money to buy Super NES cartridges. But I, what, what was one man's trash was another's treasure. Um, so I ended up collecting a huge collection of original NES games. But probably after that, uh, Super Mario Brothers 2, Super Mario Brothers 3, Tetris, Dr. Mario, uh, Legend of Zelda, you know, like so many cartridges from there, which actually leads me into favorite Nintendo game. All right, let's go. I, you know, I was going to say favorite Nintendo game of all time is tough, right? Because obviously there are games that hold a special place in our heart for nostalgia reasons and the time they hit in our life. And there are games that we can just objectively say, this is a modern game. It has better mechanics. It has, you know, like, so it depends what you value. But for me, I'm, I'm going with a full nostalgia vote on this. My personal favorite Nintendo game is Paperboy for the original NES. Whoa, unexpected. Yep. Unexpected, right? <laughs> Deep cut. Uh, so it was my one Christmas present one year. So highly valued, a highly valued game. But also it was the first Nintendo game, the first video game really, that I ever played that I felt very good at. <laughs> and like competitively good, which... Listeners and yourself are probably thinking, Trisha, Paperboy is not a competitive game. Uh, I made it a competitive game. I was like, look, I can speed run this full week in Paperboy on one life faster wow. than anybody I know. Bring it. Uh, and, you know, back then, that was the day of, like, if you're player one, player two has to wait patiently until you die to play. So I always gen generously was like, look, I'll be player two. Because once I go, you won't get to play anymore because I'm going to just beat the whole game. Um, but it was the first game that I really felt like very skilled at. <laughs> and so I played a ton of it. I had my whole strategy, uh, you know, like which houses to ignore, which houses to keep. I knew how to get through every obstacle course. You pick the right, you know, part of the path at every part. Um, and yeah, I, I felt a lot of pride in that. So maybe it was the first game, the first video game I ever played that I was like genuinely proud of my skills. Do you think that's the best you've ever been at a video game relative to other people's skills? Maybe. Really? Yeah, wow. maybe, uh, honestly. <laughs> and that does not say a lot for me as a competitive gamer now. <laughs> um, but I'm not really a competitive gamer. A lot mm. of the games that I play are solo experienced games. I'm mostly someone that really adores video games for the journey they take me on and the experience they take me on, uh, much more so than like the, yeah, I pwned some noobs. Like, that's not really my jam. Uh, <laughs> my, my jam is much more like, I played this game and it was so beautiful and I cried at the end and it moved me. Like, that's, that's much more the type of gamer I am. So, yeah, I mean, Paperboy might have been the... <laughs> that... And Heroes of Might and Magic 2, I was really good at. Whoa. That's not on Nintendo, but those are like, no, maybe those are like the games that I'm like, hey, look, I'm mad good at this, so watch out. Other games, I'm like, I can reasonably hold my own, mm -hmm. but not like, like, there are many games out there, I'll be very honest, that I am really good in my group of friends. And then I get online and it's opened up globally <laughs> and I just get schooled. Mm -hmm. so i i feel like really with the dawn of this is so funny but with the dawn of online gaming i got more reserved like i was like i can beat all the kids in my neighborhood and i feel real good about that and then it's like now some person in you know on the other side of the planet that's probably 15 years younger than me just totally wiped to the floor with me in this and you know i'm very humbled and that's okay i i had that exact same experience <laughs> with like halo 2 right like I was playing Halo 2 with my dorm mates when I was in college, and I was like, okay, I'm one of the better Halo 2 players for sure. And because it was like kind of the early days of like high-speed internet, like the 
dorm was on a local network, right? It wasn't like you couldn't play outside of the dorm. It was only people on the campus that you were playing oh, wow. against. So I was playing against like other people at my school and I was like, wow, I'm like really good at this game. And then like, I would go home for like Christmas break or something. And I'd be playing against like other people online. I'd be like, oh no, this is a very small sample size of like the people that I'm used to like just destroying in this game. Uh, but the one game that I've always been like uh, ahead of the curve was Guitar Hero. Ooh, really? Tell me I, more. I played competitively for a while. Like I would like win tournaments when I was in college, like junior year and senior year of college. I was like going around to tournaments and like winning the grand prize at every single one of them. The good I thing it's still this. so good. It's it's so popular still to this day. No, uh, one day it will come back and it'll be the age of Brian once more. I'll uh, tell you, Brian, when I see Guitar Hero in an arcade, I go right for it. Oh, it's so good. A Guitar yeah. Hero or a DDR pad, I'm right there. <laughs> I used to be pretty good at DDR back in like middle school, <laughs> but like, I don't know if I could do it these days. Like, I'm, I, I don't know, but... Uh... <laughs> DDR was another one where I was like real great against all my friends. And then, but even I'd be great against all my friends, like at on the home mats. And then you'd go to the local arcade and there'd be some kid that just schooled you. It's like, that's all they do. Yeah. That's all they do. So many quarters invested in this machine. And also playing, I, I don't know if this is the same arcade versus home for guitar hero, but for dance dance revolution, Playing on an arcade DDR machine is vastly different than playing at home. Oh, yeah, because it's got, like, the metal grates and everything, and it's up yep. on the platform as opposed to, like, the little, like, almost like a rug that you can, like, right. slide all around on. Yeah, for sure. I used to have the DDR pad for my PS1. Um, what was it? The Kona Mix, it was yeah, called, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like, Guitar Hero is very much that way as well, where it's, like, you... It's the guitar is different, which is always a big difference. Like when you're you're jumping in, like especially if you're playing like on expert or competitive or anything like okay. that, because like I specifically needed like at for a while I needed like the Guitar Hero Two Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty guitar was like the one I wanted to use, and like I wasn't good at like the other ones or like the Rock Band guitars. The, mm. the strum bar felt just a little bit too mushy, and the buttons didn't like click in the right way. So oh. I. I mean, I can play them, but I'm not nearly as good, right? So, like, going... And also, the other big thing with Guitar Hero Arcade is some of them aren't calibrated properly. So, like, you go in, it's, like, the notes, you're you're strumming to the rhythm, but, like, it's not registering because it's so out of sync mm -hmm. with, like... And you have to do that at home as well, but it's you know, you have no control over it when you're at an arcade, so. <laughs> right, right, exactly. And I know, Brian, uh, in your room, you have a guitar. Do you play guitar in real life, too? You know, I used to be pretty good at guitar back in high school and college, especially. And then during COVID, I was like, I really want to get back into guitar. So I, I did get back into guitar for a little bit. And it's been probably a year and a half since I've touched that guitar, aside from like to move it to vacuum. <laughs> so. Okay, but do you feel like Either playing Guitar Hero affected you playing guitar in real life or vice versa? I feel like Guitar Hero gave me a little bit more finger dexterity, which allowed me to be better at real guitar. I don't think it translated vice versa. And I think okay. that a lot of real guitar players actually have a hard time transitioning because, like, you know, you have the strings that you can go on the different frets, whereas, like, Guitar Hero is just like, here's these buttons. Here's the five <laughs> buttons that you have, and that's it. I mean, five buttons if you're good. I started on the three buttons and maybe got to four. So hey, I started on on medium, and I thought I was like the greatest ever. And then like slowly worked my way up to expert, and then I was like, okay, I've got a five star every single song in this game. And uh, yeah, for a while there, I was I was really good. But that's awesome. Yeah, I that, love that's. That. And then I, I guess the only other game that I was like okay at in terms of like relative to other players for a while was Overwatch. I was really mm. good at Overwatch. I had a thousand plus hours in the first Overwatch. Who do you um, mean? God, well, that's the trick, right? Is I I loved Moira for a long okay. time, but like I really loved playing Mystery Heroes because I love like them forcing me out of my comfort zone. And it's like, oh, I've got to play as Reinhardt now. And it's like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I really love like kind of the roulette style of that, where it's like, where, who am I going to spawn as next? And it's like a really fun aspect. It's the same reason I like to put on my playlists on my phone and hit shuffle because it's like, what's going to pop up. That's my favorite thing is like being surprised by that. Maybe that's why I like Pokemon cards so much. I don't know. Um, Maybe. 
<laughs> Amazing. But I, I mean, I was really good at Overwatch for a while. And it's the same thing for fighting games, though. It's like, I can't play the same character over and over again. Like, yeah, I would say, like, I'm a Ken main in Street Fighter. But, like, when I'm playing online with a friend and we're just playing each other over and over again, I am usually choosing a different character every fight. Because mm -hmm. I want to, I want to just you know have some variety, and of course, there's certain characters that I go back to more than others. Yeah. Like I'm not really a Zangief player; you're not going to really catch me selecting him. But like, I might dabble with Cammy or Chun Li or something instead. Um, but yeah. Okay. Speaking of fighting games, I'm going to tangent us here for a second. Speaking Let's of fighting it. games, but bringing it back to Nintendo, my seven year old has recently gotten very into Super Smash Bros. Oh. And me, as a non-competitive gamer, I'm like, I have played some Super Smash Bros. I am not great at Super Smash Bros. I'm a full-on, let's get in, button mash, and have a good time. And then that's pretty much it. Like, there's a couple characters. I know the moves, but it's very limited, right? Mm -hmm. um, but he's, I'm so proud of him. He's getting so good now. <laughs> and he is getting to the point where he can beat me sometimes. And wow. that makes... That makes me as a parent very, very proud. But I would ask you, since you mentioned fighting games, who's your Super Smash Bros. go-to? Oh, man. For a long time, it was Pikachu. And that was just okay. because I was such, like, a Pokemon head back in the day. <laughs> and, like, it was so cool to have, like, Pikachu fighting Mario and Link and Samus. Uh, who do That's I my son with Lucario right now. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lucario's really good. I like Mewtwo. Um... I like the like the Captain Falcon style play, which also means I like Ganondorf. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a diehard Sonic fan, so I do choose him, even though I'm not good at playing Sonic. I think he's okay. too fast for me. Um, but yeah, like I don't know. There's a there's a really solid roster of characters at this point. Uh, you know, we hung out at the Final Fantasy VII Rebirth event. I like playing as Cloud. Okay. Um, and then of course, like. Ken or uh, Ken and Ryu because they have the uh, you can put in actual Street Fighter inputs to get them to do the moves, which is really cool. Oh, I didn't know that. That's fun. Yeah, and it's actually I think it does more damage if you put in the actual like quarter circle punch for the Hadouken. Whoa, that's rad. Yeah, they do really cool little touches. Like Masahiro Sakurai is such a gem of a, a developer. Like the level of like i guess research that he does into yeah. like the ips that he brings in and like i, I also like joker because i'm a big persona fan okay um but yeah i mean i just named like a third of the roster <laughs> i mean but you know what that just goes to show how well balanced it is right that you can pick mm -hmm. any of those fighters and still do pretty well um i started with kirby like i feel like most people do because mm -hmm. you can recover well if you get knocked off and that drop rock is pretty sweet so good. Uh, yeah, so good. Um, and then I moved on. Now it's generally I'll mix it up between Link and Peach. Oh, okay. I, um, I don't I like, do like Peach's Link. ultimate, but I really like that she can hit people with a bum bounce from the side. Like she oh, takes the right, bustle of that dress and just ha cha and like <laughs> smacks you right with the bum. And I just think that's hilarious. So I go with that a lot. Plus the Paracel's cheeky. It is. Um, but she's a little slow. Like, I'm looking for something that I'm like, okay, there are certain maps that I can totally own with Peach, but other mm -hmm. maps, no, no, thank you. Not great for me. <laughs> now, I'm sure there's going to be some, like, pro Peach players out there that are like, girl, you just don't know. And that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> I haven't spent that much time in Super Smash Bros., as I said, but... It's still very fun, very good game. That's the thing about, like, when you have, like, a job where you're either covering video games like I do or streaming video games, you have to play a lot of different games unless you're just specialized in that one game, right? Like, it's like, I would love to put another thousand hours into game X, right? But it's like, all right, I reviewed that game. I loved it. I gave it a really high score. But now I have another game I have to jump over and review. And it, it makes it really challenging to, like, specialize in, like one game especially when like you're kind of generalist game media like i am yeah um, yeah it, you're absolutely correct for me the trick is always um i get to start a lot of games i don't get to finish a lot of games mm -hmm. um because i predominantly earn my living as an on-camera host yes talking about gaming or gaming electronics or hardware um and you know pc building and that kind of stuff and so i always say to my uh twitch viewers specifically but on all my social media platforms like hey i can only create content when i'm not on set so if i have a really busy week hosting or i'm out of the country on a shoot for a few weeks i don't i can't really 
spend time streaming as much as I'd like to, or, you know, uh, if at all. And mm-hmm. so on the days I'm not on set, you'll find me on Twitch is always my joke. Um, but then that means that the time I am on Twitch is so limited that let's say you want to finish out a Baldur's Gate 3 run. Impossible. Holy moly. Next to impossible. Final Fantasy, like there, there are the rare games I have finished on stream, but it like takes me five to six months to get all the way through it based on how much I realistically can stream and the other games I'm getting distracted with at the same time. Like right now, it's still trying to finish out Baldur's Gate 3 while I'm trying to finish out Final Fantasy VII Rebirth while I still haven't finished Spider-Man 2 while Princess Peach Showtime just dropped though. And you know, Uh. and it's like all over the place. So there are very few games that actually get finished on my stream, uh, but lots of games get started. I try to play almost everything that comes out so that if I'm hired for an opportunity to talk about something, I have a working knowledge of it, right? Like I've put mm-hmm. six to 10 hours at least into almost every title that comes out. Wow. Which, I mean, we're living in the golden age of gamers. There's a lot coming out. <laughs> and I mean, some of these games, like six to 10 hours is almost nothing. Like you're still hitting mm-hmm. tutorials in Persona 5, like 15, 20 hours in. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So that's what I'm like. I'll play it until I feel like, okay, I have a pretty good handle on what this is. Or I just, I have to pull away for something else. And there are certain games that make the return to this please list and other Mm -hmm. games that I'm like, okay, I got my fill of that. Thank you. That's always a talent though, is like figuring out like very quickly, like what games you like, what games you don't, because sometimes like you don't really click with a game until like 20 hours deep and you're like, oh, now it makes sense. Yes. But But a lot of times like it's like too little too late at that point. It's like, no, I moved on 10 hours ago. Can I, can I give a confession Go that I've it. never said on the internet before? And this audience is going to be like, blasphemy, Trisha, how exclusive. dare you? <laughs> this is an exclusive hashtag unpopular opinion. It took me a long time to really get hooked on Breath of the Wild. I could see that. Like, because I was kind of, you know, like it first came out, I was streaming it probably four to five hours a day, mm-hmm. uh, which again, like takes a while to really like start to get into the meat and potatoes. And in open world games, I'm very distracted. I have to go after every shiny. So I was like not main objectiving at all. I was talking to everybody. I was looking for shrines. I was, you know, doing my own thing for a real long time. Um, and it wasn't until I put a pause in it and got distracted by something else and came back to it maybe even off stream. I think I started playing it like on long flights for work. So Mm -hmm. I'd have like six hour plus flights for work. And I'd be like, I'm just going to sit down and shrine it out a little in Breath of the Wild and chill. Shrine it out. (laughs) Yeah. It was, and and it took, but it took me playing consistently Mm -hmm. uh, enough in a row to really fall head over heels in love with it. Where, and for me, that's the point where like, I'm thinking about it when I'm not playing. Like, oh, yeah. and, and that game got me like that, but it took, I want to say I was probably 40 hours in. Whoa, that long. Yeah. Yeah. Because before that it was broken up, like mm-hmm. other things were coming in between, but it probably took me about 40 hours before I was like, wow. hold up, wait a second. I can't stop thinking about Breath of the Wild. <laughs> Well, the thing for Breath of the Wild was like, I, I've said this so many times on this show, so apologies to the listeners, but like. I always thought that nothing would ever top Ocarina of Time for me. I thought Mm. like that's going to be my favorite game for the rest of my life because nothing will ever give me that same sense of wonder. And then because, you know, at that point it was like, okay, well, I've I've played like all the open world games. I played the Assassin's Creeds and the GTAs and everything. And I'm kind of desensitized to like what a big world in a video game could be. And then Breath of the Wild comes along and completely flips that notion on its head. And I felt that same sense of wonder of like, oh my God, I could climb that mountain. And then like, there's probably something really cool up there waiting for me. And that's why it overtook Ocarina of Time as my favorite game Mm. of all time now. Because you just, the joy of discovery and- 100%. The open world. And I will say, uh, so Tears of the Kingdom is one of the games I have not finished, but have put lots of time into at this point. Like everything else. (laughs) <laughs> yes, please avoid spoilers. Um, because when I first started playing it, I was like fresh out of revisiting Breath of the Wild. Oh, yeah. So I, I jumped right in and I was like, okay, let's get our regions. Let's do our thing. And then I was like, wait a second. I'm getting through this too fast. Mm-hmm. Pause, time out, take a break, play something else. Because I want to be able to savor it for a really long time like I did with Breath of the Wild. 
Um, and so, yeah, so I like take a pause, but now it's funny because I find that every time I return to it, I'm playing tears like I play breath. Really? So yes. And I so have to so? keep reminding myself, like, or I don't have to cheese up this mountain with stamina potions. You can build something. I can build a thing. It took or, me so long to like have that click in my brain of like, oh, I can fuse a weapon together. Yes. So fusing weapons, I've gotten, I like to fuse silly weapons. So I've been okay with that. Um, but like forgetting that I have ascend. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. That was the one that t I think took me the longest. <laughs> Forgetting I have a send or like, I don't know, I discovered a cave the other day where I was like, well, it's rainy inside this cave. There's no way for me to climb these walls. There must be another entrance at the top somewhere. <laughs> and then I was like, you dumb, dumb. I need to make like a hot air balloon or something. Like, it, it's funny because I use the expression. You're not like, you got to think with portals, Trish. Like, I'm like, you know, it, but mm, I'll get there. I'll get there. But you I absolutely feel like should once, see it through. Once that clicks, then I feel like it's going to be smooth sailing for me with tears. But right now I'm still playing tears like it's breath. Yeah. How many hours do you have in it? Mm, I'm going to say 20. Okay. So you're still fairly I'm early. I'm still on, fairly early. <laughs> which yes. is wild to say for 20 hours. And for someone that wears a Triforce necklace maybe every single day of her life to the point where I have like a Triforce tattoo usually uh, where my from, necklace from the sun. sits <laughs> from the sun. Yes, exactly. Um, that people are like, wait, I'm sorry, what? You haven't finished Tears of the Kingdom yet? Ma'am. But I'm like, look, I want to, I really want to, I want it to be like a years long journey. Mm -hmm. that's what I'm hoping for out of this. I've I, also, and this is super industry speak, but also as a streamer, as someone that works on camera, should a voiceover actor strike happen, Nintendo is oh. not a struck publisher. And so when it comes to the library of games, I'll be able to stream. I'm like, if that happens, that's my tears of the kingdom era, baby. <laughs> it's going to be all tears all the time. <laughs> so I don't want to blow through it too fast. That makes sense. Yeah, you right? got to save it in the reserves just in case. It's your rainy day me. fund. Just in case. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Well, let's jump into the news from here. Like we've talked about our love of Nintendo for uh, 27 minutes now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, are you a Stardew Valley fan? I like Stardew Valley. Yes. I thought, I think it's a fun game. I'm not hundreds of hours into it like some people are, but I really did enjoy the like 30-ish hours I sunk into it. So that's a game I've always wanted to jump in. And it seems like this might be the excuse that I need because it recently got its 1.6 version on PC and console players are still waiting for the update to hit their versions. And according to developer Concerned Ape, the update for console and mobile is in progress and will be released, quote, as soon as possible. So something to look forward to there because fans have been looking forward to 1.6 for a long time. And I was yeah, looking what? over like, what is it? So it adds like a whole nother like farm that you can do, I think. And it like adds a ton of content, bug fixes, okay. like all kinds of stuff. And it even recently broke the Steam concurrent players record <gasps> last month when 1.6 hit PC. I know, right? So Good like, for Stardew. I mean, I'm, the game's really fun and there's a lot you can do in it. Yeah, I mean, I got kind of like overwhelmed by it and I played mm -hmm. maybe like five hours and never went back okay okay so i'm a little farther in than you oh for sure um there there's quite a bit you can do if you want to make it a farming game great if you want to make it a fishing game great you want to make it a mining and monster hunting game great you want to make it a dating sim great you have all these different options of what you can do with this game and i think that's what people love so much about it is you can really tailor the experience to exactly what you're hoping for out of it and it's not they did a really good job balancing those different aspects it's not like okay well it's a really great farming sim but a really awful you know has a really awful fishing or monster hunting mm -hmm. or whatever like it's it's pretty nice and then they drop new surprises in there too although yeah. i have brian i have zero in-game game when it comes to romancing really? other characters. <laughs> I, I, no one loves me in games ever. It's a running joke on my Twitch stream. But like every romanceable option shoots me down hard. I just, I picked the wrong dialogue option. I gave the wrong gift. I said the wrong thing. Um, and it happens to me every single time. So no one wanted to love me in Stardew. And I had no date. 
to the festival and that made me real sad. So if you play, I want to know how you scored a date to the festival. <laughs> this is what this is what I need to know. So what the people just demand to know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So the big question that this gives me, though, is are we ever going to get Haunted Chocolatier? Because that's his next game. And he keeps saying, like, oh, I'll work on it after this final update. And then he's like, oh, I started, like, patching this other stuff. And then I realized, like, oh, I could make this another big update. And then I started working on that. And it keeps, like, it feels like the work on Haunted Chocolatier keeps getting pushed back further and further. This is the first I'm hearing of Haunted Chocolatier, and all really? I can think of is Patissier Peach. So how is Haunted Chocolatier related to Patissier Peach? <laughs> how is it related to Patissier Peach? Um, yes. Well, I don't know how it's related to her, but it's it basically sounds like <laughs> his version of, like, a Willy Wonka game. But, like, Interesting. it's a haunted, like, chocolate factory, basically. <laughs> Okay. But like, there's not a whole lot of details because every time he goes to work on it, he decides to work on uh, Stardew Valley. But maybe he's working on it on the side already. So uh, we'll never know. But like, there are some screenshots out there of like, what this game may look like. Uh, wow. But yeah, Haunted okay. Chocolatier. That's one mm. that we have been waiting for for a while. Let me see what the latest is here. I'm very curious now. Yeah. It, no release date. When was it announced? I'm just bringing up the Wikipedia page here. It was announced in has a gameplay trailer in October 2021. A, another okay. solo development project. Um, okay, it looks very Stardew Valley. I'm looking at some of the gameplay they've shown for it. Yeah, it uh, it looks like it would be right up my alley, which I also said about Stardew Valley. And then I then you only like, put five, to play hours five hours into it. Yeah. <laughs> I really like. It's one of those games where it's like I'm always wanting to go back, but it's yes. like. The, uh, the kind of the catchphrase on this show is with what time i mean so that's you know that's the meme that's like now that i'm a, an adult i have the money for the gaming hardware and no time to play and when i was a kid i had no money and all the time yes to play. especially in jobs that have gaming like people assume that we just play video games all day for work but it's like no there's a lot of like playing video games for work is like maybe like 10 to 15 percent of my job <laughs> exactly yep yep and that's it's funny because especially from the content creation angle right like the fun part is all people get to see and if you're doing oh, yeah. your job right it shouldn't look like work mm -hmm. but then all the hours of off-camera time when you're figuring out the business aspects and how to monetize the content because lots of people can put content out there how are you monetizing said content how are you turning this into a business that's the actual job <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And praying to the god of Adobe Premiere that you'll export without <laughs> crashing because that was what ultimately did in the first run of video episodes of all things Nintendo was Adobe Premiere. Now I use a different oh. software program, so I, uh, I'm having a little bit better luck so far, but we'll see. If you're not watching this on YouTube or the YouTube version doesn't exist, we know that the, <laughs> the second time was not the charm for exporting that, that with this new it. piece of software. Yeah. I still premiere, so I feel your pain. Um, and just today, I like put something up on, I put up a video that I worked very hard on uh, on Instagram. And I am an Android user. And uh, Instagram doesn't always want to play nicely on Android. And so today, it was just like, oh, I'm sorry, did you want to post that today? You can no longer crop, crop a uh, the... The profile photo for this reel. Sorry, we're just not letting you do that today. The grid. Or we'll tell you you could do it, but then it's not going to post right. Ha 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 ha. Instagram on Android. I hate Android. that so much. I mean, it um, doesn't for iOS too. Let's 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 put it? the cards on the table. Okay. Instagram always... has a lot of glitches on iOS as well. All right, that makes me feel a little bit better. <laughs> um, but also, then it's like, oh, did you want to change the color on that text in your story? Mm, we're not allowing that today. Uh, and just <laughs> just things like that that you're like. All right. Or I was doing my, um, I do an indie game showcase weekly on Twitch. I was doing my indie game showcase last week and Steam just decided it, it was doing its Tuesday update. And this week's Tuesday update was just going to go for like a real long time. And it was just like, no, nope, no games for you for a while. And like every game I fired up, even in offline mode was force closing and glitching. Out. And uh... I was like, you know what? Best laid plans, folks. Yeah, I mean, that's the <laughs> hardest thing is like some like a lot of software is just surprisingly volatile. It happens, but we do our best and we love what we do. <laughs> so we push through it. Um, I always still I consider myself very, very fortunate that I get to talk about things that I've been passionate about my entire life and mm -hmm. call it a career. 
Um, oh, same. So even even on the very challenging days, which there are many, <laughs> <laughs> overall, I'm still very grateful. Um, like just just before we recorded this, uh, Brian, you prop- popped into my stream for a little bit and I ended up playing, I don't think this is available on Nintendo, uh, but Stray Gods, the role-playing musical. I think it is. I think it is, is it? on Switch. I want yeah. to say it is. That's what I was playing just earlier today. I'm in act two of that because sure again, I never finish anything. Okay, good. It is available on Nintendo. Uh, I'm only on act two because I never finish games. I start them and then put a pin in them and come back to them mm-hmm. later. But this is one that I've circled back to several times now, which is why I'm all the way in act two already. But it's got an all-star voice cast. And yeah. it is for musical theater geeks who also like to play RPGs. This is the game you've been searching for. <laughs> um, and so it's very unique. And I always love checking out things that are doing something different in games, um, which, Brian, I'm guessing you feel the same way because you see so many different games, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I do like things like, for lack of a better term, that are inspired by like classic games that I love. Like if there's like mm-hmm. a new 2D platformer that's getting like really good reviews, I am stoked for that because that was what I cut my teeth in um, when I was growing up, mm-hmm. right? But like, I love that like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, it tried a lot of new things with like how it's like design is and how it's gameplay mm-hmm. is. And I really like that. Like for as good as the original Final Fantasy VII is, I love the remake trilogy so much. And I think that they've made some really smart changes and it's nice to see these established franchises take some risks. I mean, Breath of the Wild, look no further than like, one yeah. of the biggest yeah. franchises to ever exist, taking some huge swings and knocking them out of the park. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm with you on the Final Fantasy remake trilogy. I just I love that we're getting new stories around characters and worlds yeah. we love so much. Like I know so many people were like, oh, they're departing from the original storyline. And I was like, you know what? Maybe it's because I read too many comic books, but I'm like, I'm okay with like a multiversal take. Like give mm. me a new story with these characters and world I love. And that's okay. And if I end up loving the original trilogy storyline more, that's okay too. Yeah. It's all fine. They still <laughs> exist. That story they still, still exists. exists. Yes. You know, I, I got to interview M Shadows, the singer from Avenged Sevenfold. Okay. And th- that is a band that is very like distinctly different eras, right? Like there's like, oh, there's this era. Then there's this era. Then this era sounds like this. And I asked him like, how does it feel when like you put out a new song and like, everybody is like or like you see a big chunk of your fans being like oh why don't you sound like this album anymore and he's like hey i'm glad they like that stuff but like as an artist i need to evolve i need to like move forward and if you like that era like that's awesome but that music still exists like we're not deleting that album and putting out this new album right and i I really like that answer because like you know we forget that like art is not just created for the consumer it's created for the artist as well yes Absolutely. Yep. And that's, I mean, that's my whole thing with variety streaming too. Like I know content creation wise, all the algorithms would love me much more if I only played one game all the time, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't feed my soul as someone that enjoys lots of types of video games. For sure. I want to enjoy lots of them, please. There's so many good ones being made right now. (laughs) So many. So many. We're very Um, lucky. Keeping up with them is almost impossible, but... You know what's easier to keep up with because they're a whole lot shorter? Movies. And we've gotten a lot of movie news this week. And uh, there's only one that really concerns me and us and this show. During CinemaCon, Paramount showed off some new footage of the Sonic the Hedgehog 3 movie. Are you a fan of the Sonic movies? I like them. I watch them with my son. We like them in our house. (laughs) I like them in this house as well. So the footage... (laughs) is not available as far as I've seen. I'm sure somebody had like a shaky cam and they're recording it and posting it and probably Paramount is like sending cease and desist to them. Yeah, I don't want to support that. I want to see it for real when it's ready. But we saw descriptions and it said that the footage showed Sonic, Tails, and Knuckles facing off against Shadow. Very exciting. Very exciting. And then another scene of Sonic and Shadow fighting in the sky on top of Shadow's motorcycle. And then there was a teaser of a heavier Jim Carrey as Dr. Robotnik. And apparently he made a joke about how he uh, he put on all this weight because of he was eating too many carbohydrates. <laughs> so that, that's the only description we have. Still no word on Shadow's voice actor. But what is your hype level for this third Sonic movie? 
I mean, we're going to watch it. My house, we're big Sonic movie fans. As soon as it's in theaters, we're going to go. Um, and wasn't it, I'm trying to remember, wasn't it the end of the last Sonic movie that he first says Eggman? Did he? Oh, man, I, I don't know. The last time I saw Sonic 2 was like before it came out. I went to a screener and... I think you might be right. Like I've kind of like not even like registered with me because I'm so used to it being Eggman in the games at this point, like ever since right. Sonic Adventure. But yeah, I mean, I want I want to say that was teased last time, so it doesn't surprise me that they're like going with that transition even mm -hmm. further in the third game. Uh, but honestly, like there aren't that many great movies in theaters to take kids to. So when there's one that I will also enjoy, that goes right on the top of the list of like, okay, opening weekend, babe, we're going. I'm assuming you love the Mario movie then as well. Loved the Mario yes. movie. It was really funny for me to see the discourse online between like the adults that were picking it apart for reasons. And like, for me, I was like, oh my gosh, that soundtrack alone. I like teared up so many times watching that film just because the soundtrack like they, we'd see Peach's Castle and they'd play Peach's Castle. They you know, did such like a it was job. so, they did such a good job. Um, DK Rap was oh in there. God. Like all these moments that I'm just like, oh, my childhood. It's like, you know, all coming back. So I loved it for that reason. And then also seeing my kid get so excited. It was one of the first uh, movies he got to see in theaters that was popular. Like we did a lot of like matinee daytime movies where no one else was in the theater. Mm -hmm. uh, like circa endo pandemic kind of times um, that when we're finally in a theater and there's other people there, I had to keep reminding him, like, you can't shout things. And then everybody else was probably theater. shouting stuff. <laughs> but yeah, like, the, especially like the Mario versus uh, Donkey Kong battle. Yeah. Oh man, my I had to like keep my kids sitting down because he kept like jumping up on his seat and he was like, Yeah, get him. And I was like, okay, woo, we're in a theater, the other people watching, we're gonna reel that back. But like seeing how much he loved it and how involved he was and invested, it just it moved me in so many ways. I we loved it. We own it now on Blu-ray. Mm -hmm. It's on repeat in our house. We love it. I love that movie too. It's one of the best video game adaptations that exist. I mean, it's up there. I mean, it's completely different tonally, but like The Last of Us is like the other one that I think of mm. in terms of like just giving the fans of the game what they want, right? Like yeah. The Last of Us is such, I mean, it's dreary and it's it's a little bit miserable at times, but like so is it's the game. done so well. Yeah, exactly. You can tell <laughs> that the creators of the game were heavily involved. Yeah. Same thing for the Mario movie. Same thing for Fallout. Like I was Fallout, just which say, just have hit. You started yeah. Fallout yet? I'm only it's one episode good. in, but yeah, oh, like one episode's enough. You know, you're bit by the bug. It's good for sure. Bit by the rad roach. <laughs> I, it, it made me bummed that we couldn't talk more about that. I mean, we could if we want. It's my show, uh, but like, there's not like there's only one Fallout game on Switch, and it's Fallout Shelter. <laughs> <laughs> so i mean we could do like a, a thing about the fallout Wait, like, we shelter the mobile game where you can like run your yeah. own vault <laughs> so it's not even like you're going out into the wasteland it's just like no hey, this is not no shade though that game was good I... fallout shelter is not bad before like switch existed i think that, that fallout shelter existed before switch did that was like my go-to plane game because i you couldn't you didn't need an internet connection <gasps> is that true i'm pretty sure if it's oh, yeah. still on mobile, I will download it for my next plane escapade. Uh, Maybe I'm although, wrong there. Although I still like using my um, my flights to Shrine Hunt. Oh, yeah. In, in Breath of the Wild or Tears. Because I'm like, you know, if I don't progress any major story points, I just figure out a few new shrines. I don't think, like, off stream, I don't think that'll make my audience too upset. And then watch, <laughs> I'll, like, find the one shrine that everyone's waiting to see or something like that just my luck but that's that's what i used to do with breath of the wild is like i'll just get a new couple new shrines no big deal uh you know i'll just i'll get some more rupees it'll be fine and then i just won't do any main mission content until it's so I hard to avoid that though because sometimes like you stumble upon it and you're like oh yeah. okay i'm that's how i stumbled upon the final battle i'm not gonna spoil what? it but i was like oh what's over here and then i just kept going and then i was like Oh, this is happening. Okay. <laughs> in tears? Even, I skipped an entire like main mission in the story <laughs> because I was just exploring and I was like, 
huh, okay, this is like getting really tough. And I'm like, oh, snap. Okay, this is this is it. Okay. That's hilarious. <laughs> And That's then, like, hilarious. I went back and did, like, that other mission that I missed, and I was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm slowly working at the second region right now. In okay. Gotcha. I'm just taking my time. Just taking my time. So we in- also... Go ahead. I was going to say, in fact, maybe uh, we'll play that on Nintendo Weekly, but we'll see. To, to, to be determined. I'm always in favor of more Zelda. So, yes, <laughs> if you're listening to this now and you are going back, you can actually see what we played on Nintendo Weekly. <laughs> you can uh, coming to you from the past, we also got a new interview from Paste Magazine with Toby Asher, who is the producer of the Sonic movies and the streaming franchise. And here's what he had to say, quote, we got really excited about the idea of expanding our characters in our in our world into television specifically because it gives us a platform to really do character studies. We knew that with Shadow coming into Sonic 3 and some of the bigger things that we want to do. The Sonic franchise on the movie side is going to be these Avengers level events. They're going to be these big, exciting stories that have a lot of different characters. And so what television did for us is it gave us time to go into some of the more supporting characters in depth and really build them out in cool ways. And then he also said that he loved the fish out of water moments from Sonic 2, which is why they wanted to expand that into a full series with the knuckles show that's coming out very, very soon, by the way. And he also references doing something along the lines of Sonic three and knuckles, which shout out to my favorite Sonic game with how the knuckles series and Sonic, the hedgehog three will fit together narratively. So little hints there. And I do really appreciate the final quote that we're going to cover here. He said, first and foremost, the goal going into the series was how do we replicate the movie quality in a much more condensed timeline? We knew that if all of a sudden this looked like a ripoff series or something that was really shoddily put together, not only would fans reject it, but it'll damage what we've made. So it seems like the teams behind the Knuckles series are treating this as like much more than just a quick cash in on the popularity of the Sonic franchise. Because I feel like it's come out recently that like some of like the Marvel stuff on Disney+, Plus, for example, was kind of like, a a directive from like the ceo of like we really need to build out our disney plus content let's just do a bunch of like marvel series because people love the mcu and we've seen kind of like a downturn in the quality of some of those things so i'm glad that this isn't like paramount being like oh people love the sonic movies let's put a knuckles show starring itris elba on paramount plus and get people to subscribe to paramount plus it seems like they actually are trying to make it so that these are like high quality things that rival kind of the quality of the movie Yeah, I mean, that's so important. And you're absolutely right with the MCU. Like people are going to burn out on something if they're just being inundated with very Mm -hmm. mediocre content over and over. And then they're like, all right, I I thought I loved the MCU or Star Wars or whatever big Mm -hmm. Sonic, whatever big property you want to put on it. But like the last couple of times I really got invested in something, it was just okay. So like maybe I need to divert my attention elsewhere. So you don't want to burn your big franchise, your big property by putting out mid content. I think that's great. I love that they're aware enough to put that out there. That's really cool. Yeah. And hopefully that means that, you know, we'll know in a couple of weeks, I think it comes out what April 26th, I think is the knuckles release date on Paramount plus. Awesome. And it's live action. It's not, it's live I mean, action. Cool. Um, I mean, obviously knuckles, not so much, but <laughs> I mean, we got well, Idris Elba but voicing you know him what still. I mean, but like, yes. still because, and I say that because, my with my son we watch a lot of the animated mm-hmm. sonic series that are available f- for streaming um and so i honestly i don't know where i've been i missed that there was a knuckles series even coming so he's gonna be my kid's gonna be thrilled and especially knowing that it's going to kind of fit directly into the narrative of sonic 3 like that's exciting like that's i exciting. sonic 3 is something i'm very much looking forward to i did a lot of coverage of sonic 2 when that was coming out i got to mm-hmm. interview the cast and the director and everything and that was cool really rad i'm hopeful i get that chance again because they were like ben schwartz he is such a sonic fan like he is like as nerdy about Sonic almost as much as I am. So like talking with him about like his love for Sonic mania and how like he would love to see like Studiopolis zone appear in like the movies and everything. Like I was super about that. So it's always great when like people have a love for like the, the franchise that they're working on, because like, I don't think Idris Elba, he does a great job, but I don't think he, cares about the sonic franchise. (laughs) Same thing with Jim Carrey, but like I love Idris Elba. So so do I. 
but yes, I don't know that he is like a, a living, breathing Sonic fan. I mean, but like Tom Holland, for example, like he, when he was playing Spider-Man, they dropped off a PlayStation in his trailer because, you know, Sony owns the Spider-Man franchise or they own the rights to the Spider-Man franchise. So they had PlayStations in all the trailers and they gave him Uncharted 4 and he played that and he was like, wow, this game is amazing while he was shooting Spider-Man Homecoming. And then he went back and got like the Nathan Drake trilogy and that's how he got into it. And then like when the time came to cast a Nathan Drake for the Uncharted movie, he was like all about it and he already had that pre-existing relationship. So that's how he went about like landing that role. So it actually pays to game, it turns out. <laughs> and our Henry Cavill with Witcher. Yeah. Um, now, granted, he was a big fan of the books, um, but still, like, anyone that's a fan of the property and the content and the source material before it getting into through. it, it shines through. For sure. And then last thing from Sonic here. Uh, Sonic Team announced that they are calling this year Fearless, the Year of Shadow, Due to Shadow's costume coming to Sonic Superstars, Shadow appearing in Sonic the Hedgehog 3, the movie, and him getting a co-headlining role in the upcoming Sonic Cross Shadow Generations. I will say, and my guest for that episode, Dom, uh, Dom went ahead and tweeted this, and he was just like, we willed this into existence, or we joked this into existence, because when they announced Shadow coming to Sonic Superstars, I said, this is kind of turning into the year of Shadow. And lo and behold, a couple weeks later, Dom, we did it. It's official. It is the year of shadow. And I'm really just hoping that they aren't setting themselves up for like a year of Luigi type year, because that was an absolute mess for Nintendo back in like 2013. I love Luigi. I do too, but his year was not good for Nintendo. I remember they expect, they, they like pushed the year of Luigi into 2014 as well, because like one of the games that they were putting out for him got delayed. And it was just oh, like, no. how long is this year going to last? I'm trying to think back to that. I don't fondly remember that. So that says something right there. Well, it was a very underwhelming year for uh, (laughs) for Nintendo because that was like the heart of like Wii U is not the thing. Oh, yes. Like they were discovering like, oh, this this system is not going to be like our next big thing. Um, Yeah, I think the, the game I played the most on the Wii U was probably Mario Party. Wow. Yeah, that says a lot because, you know, there were some really good games on the Wii U, but it just didn't sell. Nobody, nobody cared. It, and that's why yeah. we saw so many of the Wii U games come to Switch because they were like, mm-hmm. oh, we have this built in library. And like, look at Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, literally just an improved version of a Wii U game. Yeah. And it's and, the top selling so game. People hadn't played it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's the top selling Switch game by not a little bit. It destroys everything else by like tens of millions of units. So there you I go. Mean, they finally put Pauline in Mario Kart 8 Deluxe. <laughs> and that's what I'm waiting for in everything. I'm a big Pauline stan. Okay. Um, so I'm waiting for Pauline to come to Super Smash Bros. And then maybe I'll put in the time to get good at Super Smash Bros. But well, I'm going to say that Mario Kart 8 Deluxe is so popular because they added Pauline. But that's 100% not true because she's a very new addition. It was popular long before that. Hey, that booster course pass is incredible. Literally doubling the courses that are in the game. Like yeah. it was already the biggest roster of, of tracks and now it's doubled. That's that's crazy. So good. So we're going to move along because we are, we are going a little long on the news segment. Apologies. Uh, we got a slew of indie announcements as part of a Triple I initiative live stream. And I don't know how many of these you saw, but we're going to kind of speed run these. So there's uh, here's some of the highlights. We got the Rogue Prince of Persia which is a roguelite Prince of Persia game from the developers of Dead Cells with a super unique cartoon style visual aesthetic. This actually kind of throws back to like a question that I answered during the segment where it was just me before you joined, where they asked like, if you had unlimited money and like access to a Nintendo IP, like what developer would you make like a cross, like what developer would you take? What IP would you take? And what um, style would you make a game? And, like, this is kind of up there, right? Like, a roguelike Prince of Persia game with the developers of Dead Cells. Like That's pretty cool. Yeah, that's a really cool one. Um, I mentioned, like, my my pitch is a, uh, a roguelite Zelda game where you play as Ganon and you have to try to conquer Hyrule. And each time you're defeated, you respawn with a different art style and different gameplay style. Like, kind of like the series itself. But, uh, yeah, that's kind of my dream. But that, that arrives... Cool. That arrives PC early access in May. It's not confirmed for Switch just yet, but I would be very surprised if the 1.0 launch doesn't arrive on whatever Nintendo console is around when it comes out. Uh, another game that isn't announced for Switch, but I, again, I'd be very surprised if it doesn't come eventually, is Slay the Spire 2. I'm so excited for Slay the Spire 2! 
Yes, I, I this is one of the ones that I kind of missed out on. I tried playing the first one, only got about an hour in. I was like, I have other stuff I need to play. Oh, you've barely touched it, my friend. I know. You didn't give it the time to like sink its hooks in and get you. Slay the Spire. I featured this on my indie game showcase when it first came out. And it made the list of like, okay, we're going to circle back and spend some more time here. <laughs> and then because it's so easy to play in small chunks, mm -hmm. it became my travel for work game. Oh, man. It's not very resource intensive, so it doesn't drain the battery on your gaming PC or whatever you're playing it on. Um, and it's so good. It's so good. And then like, you know, if the flight attendant comes by and asks if you like a cranberry juice... You can just look up and answer her without, you know, like it doesn't interrupt your game. You're mm -hmm. fine. It's fine. <laughs> There's it's a flight announcement. You need to pay attention. Totally cool. Uh, so Slay the Spire is one of my favorite go-to travel games. Um, it is so good. It is so good. You can play different styles, play styles. Give it more time, Brian. I will. So we have a while before this one comes. It's coming to early access on Steam in 2025 and then presumably consoles whenever 1.0 happens, which leads into my travel game, Vampire Survivors, one of my favorites. <laughs> yeah, but you can't, what happens if you're playing Vampire Survivors and someone's like, would you like a cookie or pretzels? Well, I hit the little plus button on my Switch and it pauses it. Yeah, I guess you can just pause it. I don't know. I have I have real problems when I'm playing something like a Vampire Survivors that demands your constant attention of being like, uh, what did you, oh, crud, pause. What, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Like, it just. <laughs> I mean, that's a cheat code for, for being on a long flight is like you look down thinking like you've played like for five minutes and you look up and it's like, oh, it's two hours later. Mm -hmm. So that's getting a Contra crossover. It's DLC. What? It's called Operation Guns on May 9th. It's going to have Contra characters, uh, I believe 20 new weapons, a higher difficulty curve to match the arcade tenant or tenure or tenor. Jeez, if I could talk, it'd be great. The arcade tenor of the original Contra game and what looks like new levels themed after Contra as well. That's really cool. Right? Like, I'm loving these Konami crossovers. Like, the Dead Cells Castlevania thing was awesome. Does the Konami code do anything? I mean, it works on Contra Operation Galuga, which just came out. Um, it's a little underwhelming because you have to still buy it with in-game currency. It just uh, unlocks it in the store. No. Um, but yeah. So uh, the last one we're going to cover here is Chia. Did you ever play Chia? Yeah, with a T in yeah, front of it. T-C-H-I-A. Yep, yep, yep. I, I only played about 45 minutes of it, though. I'll be perfectly honest. It was beautiful. Yeah, it's a gorgeous game. It takes place in, uh, or it's, it's modeled after New Caledonia, which is an island nation kind of, uh, I guess, off the coast of, uh, it's out in Oceania, Oceania, um, where it's like by like New Zealand and Australia, uh, just a very like remote, small island. And it's modeled after that, which is where a lot of the developers are from. And mm -hmm. it only came to PlayStation and PC last year, but it's coming to Switch on June 27th. And uh, nice. we gave it an 8.5 out of 10 when it came out last year. So very well-liked game. And there were a ton of other indie announcements, and you can read all about them on GameInformer.com. But uh, which of those stuck out the most to you? I mean, Slay the Spire 2. Slay the Spire 2. <laughs> I'm going to have like a countdown going on my PC for that. Um, but also the Contra crossover with Vampire Survivors is very interesting. And we'll get that soon. That can be the new exciting in a near time frame versus Slay the Spire where we got to wait till 2025. Yeah, that's I mean, May 9th, I think that was for uh, mm -hmm. for the Contra crossover. So yeah, and that's also cool. coming to PlayStation, but we don't. We're not going to talk about that. It's not a PlayStation show. It's not all things PlayStation. <laughs> Maybe one day, though. No. Um, <laughs> and finally, the last news story we're going to cover here. We got a new trailer for Adventure Mode in Super Monkey Ball Banana Rumble. So you can play in solo or up to four-player local or online co-op. 200 all-new stages. That's a mm -hmm. lot. And the game will also have several optional assist features like the ability to rewind, ghost guides, in-stage checkpoints, plenty of other stuff. And it is coming exclusively to Switch on June 25th. Are you going to check out Monkey Ball Banana Rumble? Are, are you a Monkey Ball fan? I have not played a Monkey Ball in years. 
Oh, you should go play uh, the remaster. Um, it's been a long remaster. time since I've played some Super Monkey Ball. Um, but yeah, I'm actually, I'm thinking about it and I'm like, Monkey Ball, that's a game I could play with my kid. That'd yeah, be fun. Maybe that'd a good fun. stream game too. Yeah, that'd be fun. I'd be down to jump back into some Super Monkey Ball. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to love the, the Monkey Ball game where you were like flying and like you have to open up the ball and you're like gliding, you have to drop onto the target. That was okay. always like one of the better games. We I remember my family got like, obsessive about that game on like we went to the beach one time somewhere on the east coast i think it was probably like north carolina or something and like okay. it was one of those like rainy beach days where it's like oh well we can't go outside so thankfully i brought my gamecube and we were able to play super monkey ball 2 and do all the mini games and we got like just super competitive about it that was a great great vacation we did go to the beach though don't worry once you the, know what? the rain subsided I, I can't tell you how many beach vacations i remember as a kid playing video games because it <laughs> Same. rained because it rained and you're like, well, it's movies or video games. Thank goodness I brought my console. <laughs> exactly. So that's all the news we're going to cover. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we'll be discussing the history of playing classic video games on modern Nintendo consoles. We'll be right back. Around this time last year, the Wii U and 3DS eShops closed down for good. And along with those closures, we lost access to the last virtual console standing. While we still have access to many of those games through Switch Online, I wanted to take this opportunity and spend some time talking about Nintendo's efforts to give players the ability to experience its unrivaled history. So I'm just going to run through a lot of this stuff. I, I did plenty of research into like the history of the virtual consoles and uh, and the transition to the the Switch Online. But what was your history with virtual console? Like, how big of a selling point was that for any system that you picked up? You know, it's a big reason of why I kind of steered so hard into PC gaming. To be really? perfectly honest, because yeah, on PC I don't have to worry about not being able to play a favorite game anymore. It's just that's not something I really have to worry about. I can play really old games that I used to play on a little floppy disk. Uh, I mm -hmm. can play those on PC. They're available. It's not a problem. Um, and so whenever a new console would launch, I would pay a lot of attention to backwards compatibility to see what I'd be able to play from the yesteryear. Um, and, you know, when I was younger, I would hold on to the retro consoles, but they stopped working after a while. Yeah. So there's, there's just not much you can do. So I'm a big fan of being able to play whatever software you'd like to play whenever you can. Um, and so, yeah, I, I love the idea of going back and revisiting software you may have missed, even Absolutely. on a new console. And I love that Nintendo has always been pretty good about, like, re-releasing its classic games on new hardware. Like, you know, we've got several classic games on, like, uh, Game Boy Advance. Like, that was one of the, the main... That we never got, like, a standalone Mario game, like an original Mario game. But we got like remakes of Mario One, Two, Three, and World, which was a very or not one, I guess it was. What, what was it? It was oh, it was uh, Two, Three, World, and Yoshi's Island is what we got. Nice. Um, nice. But, but yeah, like they've always been good about that. And then like Animal Crossing had like access to classic games on the GameCube, which was pretty cool. But like prior to the launch of the Wii, it was not like a thing that was like an initiative for Nintendo, and you know the first virtual console on the Wii during an Iwata asks interview uh, with, you know, the late president Satoru Iwata, mm -hmm. he was talking, this was, I was reading an interview right before the Wii came out. And uh, one of the creators of the Wii, Shinichiro Tamaki was asked which channel on the Wii he was most excited about. Cause you know, the Wii had like all these channels that you could like do like the Wii shop channel, the Wii, uh, the Wii everybody votes channel, which is one of the segments of the show is named after <laughs> um, the, the weather channel. Remember that? Like you could, you could like go and see what the weather was or like put in votes. Like it was, it was a wild system, but so, so uh, here's what Tamaki said. He said, Hmm, well, it's not yet the official name, but I personally like the so-called shopping channel. Put simply, this channel allows the user to purchase a variety of software via their Wii, starting with virtual console titles. In other words, they'll be able to purchase titles that they may have played on past Nintendo systems like NES, SNES, and Nintendo 64. It's conceivable that Wii dedicated software will eventually be available too. And I personally feel that this channel will pave the way for a new kind of game development. And really, I mean, did he just like 
kind of predict the rise of like double A development. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like the 30 to $40 digital only title, because I mean, he kind of did. And like the indies that we would eventually get through things like Xbox Live Arcade. Yeah, I mean, kind of, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so that was uh, that was an interesting quote from there. And in that same interview, Satoru Iwata pointed out that the original idea was to have separate folders for each individual system that you could purchase games for. So it'd be like an NES folder and you'd click into that and it would show you all the mm -hmm. NES games that you owned. And then like, you know, same thing for SNES, N64. And that eventually was scrapped for a system where each game you purchased would have its own tile on the Wii home screen, which is what they ultimately did. And according to a member of the user interface and effects group, uh, oh boy, this is going to be a tough one, Tomoaki Kuroemi. I'm so sorry. Uh, I actually got a, a listener email about how good I am at pronouncing a lot of the names, and I, I would have failed them if I read that question on this episode. Uh, but <laughs> according to Kuroemi, uh, they said, I think we were correct to choose the current front end. The first one we came up with had the virtual console as a single channel containing folders for each console, as you said. The user would have to go through the layers of folders to select a game. But since our concept was for the Wii to start quickly and for the user to be able to start playing as soon as possible, it didn't really seem to make sense to go to the trouble of placing games within such a deep folder structure. In our simulations of how the front end would actually be used, a number of people felt that it would be more satisfying to have all the purchase games lined up on the first screen. So if games like Mario or Zelda were placed alongside the news and forecast channels, then people will, with no interest in games might be more likely to give them a try. We therefore settled on the current front end, and this decision allowed us to stay true to our concept for Wii. So that was the Wii Virtual Console. The 3DS, which came a few years later, also had Virtual Console and the ability to create save states. Was mm -hmm. the, the 3DS, I feel like, was where I played the most Virtual Console games, even though I'm not a big handheld fan. Like, Were you a big fan of like having the 3DS and like being able to take all these classic games on the go? I'll tell you, I wish I was, uh, but I my gaming history is such that after I got so very into the original NES, my parents thought I had a problem and played too many video games. And Who so, among us? Who among us? Yeah, I never <laughs> got a Game Boy, a Game Boy Advanced. I never got any handheld because that would just make me play games on the go, which would, you know, be giving in to my problem of playing too many video games. So I looked longingly at everybody else's, but never had my own. I never had an NES, but my parents did give me an, a Super NES, and then I got a Game Boy Color for Christmas, and I got Pokemon. And I remember the first time my parents were like, maybe he's too into this, was I was I went to a seesaw, or a, 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 I'm sorry, a park with a cousin, and I was on a seesaw, and I was up at the top, and I didn't want to hold on because I was playing Pokemon, and when I got to the top, you know, it's kind of jars. Yeah. I, I fell off. Oh, <laughs> and, no. And I fell into the mulch. And, didn't uh, break your Game Boy, though, right? No, I didn't. I made sure to protect that. Protect okay, the important okay, well, stuff. Well, of course. <laughs> so but you might have broken your pride a little bit. Oh, for sure. Yeah, that was a, that. I mean, I still remember it to this day. So clearly it stuck <laughs> with me. So according to the man in charge of the 3DS Virtual Console, uh, Kuroomi, uh, in a separate Iwata asks, uh, well, I guess this wasn't Kuroomi, this was somebody else that I forgot to write down his name. Uh, with the Wii console, you can't save partway through and play over and over again. However, since there was also battery life issue back then, I figured many people, myself included, were often unable to play a game all the way to the end. And old games were really difficult. And then later he said, it would be too bad if people bought something from Virtual Console for the first time, found it too difficult, and gave up. I hope function. I hope people will make use of this function, which allows them to save any time and play the best parts over and over again, in order to beat games that they never could before. Actually, I had never cleared Super Mario Land, so I used this function playing it again and again. And after two times through, I noticed the stage select function for the first time. So that was a new thing for the 3DS was that you could actually do save states and like mm -hmm. rewind back to that. And that's actually. Full disclosure, that's how I beat A Link to the Past the first time, was on really? the 3DS okay. playing with some save states because I would get knocked off that tower where you fall down after during uh -huh. the boss fight. And I was like, I'm not doing that. If I get knocked, I'm just going to save every time I hit this guy. <laughs> and then that way I can just like start over. 
and uh, just keep going back where I was. You cheesed it. You cheesed. The I battle. cheesed that that one in particular. That that <laughs> fight in particular is miserable to this day. One of the greatest games of all time, but that encounter sucks. I hear you. So, uh, oh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, uh, nope. I absolutely, I get you. No judgment coming from me. <laughs> so the first instance of Virtual Console arrived through the Wii in November 2006 and launched with just 12 games across the NES, SNES, N64, and Sega Genesis, which was very interesting as a uh, child of the 90s to see a Sega Genesis system category on a Nintendo shopping on channel. On a Nintendo, yeah. Team Red versus Team Blue. We knew exactly. it well. Exactly. So meanwhile, the 3DS Virtual Console started in June 2011 with just four Game Boy and Game Boy Color games. And if you don't count the soft launch in January 2013, where we got Balloon Fight, the Wii U Virtual Console started in April 2013 with eight games from NES and SNES. And eventually the Virtual Console offered NES, SNES, N64, TurboGrafx-16, Sega Master System, Sega Genesis, Neo Geo, and Commodore 64 on Wii and Wii U. And the NES, SNES, TurboGrafx-16, Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Gear on the 3DS. And then uh, there were some exceptions here. The Wii U also got Game Boy Advance and DS games. While some Game Boy Advance games came to the 3DS for those who bought their system to a, prior to a certain date and were part of the Nintendo 3DS Ambassador Program. You could never buy these. You could only earn them by having the foresight to buy the 3DS before a certain date because they were so apologetic for how weak the launch window was for the 3DS that they were like, let's just give them a bunch of Game Boy Advance games and make them happy that they bought this system. Wow. So yeah, I, I was a member of that because I bought a 3DS very early on in like its cycle. Good uh, for you, you. You also had the option to import your Wii Virtual Console purchases to your Wii U for a really big discount. I think it was like 90 cents per game if you wanted to like transfer your purchases from the Wii over to the Wii U. Okay. And by the time the final releases arrived, uh, there were 398 games on the Wii Virtual Console, 172 for 3DS, not including those Game Boy Advance uh, Ambassador games, and 267 for the Wii U. And the Virtual Console, this is, this is the craziest stat, honestly, lasted until January 2019 on the Wii which was when the Wii Shop channel shut down. And then the, the Wii U and 3DS virtual consoles closed in March, 2023. You can still download games that you yeah. already purchased, but you can no longer buy them. Yep. So that was the virtual console history. And then in the lead up to the Switch, Reggie fils you know him, you love him. You've heard him on this podcast before, hinted in an interview with Wired that players wouldn't need to rebuy all their virtual console games again. Somebody said that like, oh, you know, like the interviewer is like buying all these games over and over again is really expensive. And like, I'm getting kind of sick of it. And he said, what I would say first is we recognize that some of our most passionate fans have spent quite a bit, whether it's with Virtual Console on Wii or Wii U. And we recognize that consumers are rightly concerned about moving to Nintendo Switch without backward compatibility. My comment is stay tuned. We understand the concern. More information to come. There's 40 some odd days between now and launch. There are more details to come. And at that point, we'll be able to define all those various details of that online experience. Ooh. So that was a classic Reggie tease right there. And then Nintendo Switch Online, I mean, the Nintendo Switch came out March 2017. We didn't have Nintendo Switch Online until September 2018, hmm. which you kind of forget that it was a year and a half after the Switch launched that we got Nintendo Switch Online. Before it was just like, okay, you can play games for free. It's like Splatoon 2 came out. It was like, you can play games for free. Like online. online. Yeah, yeah, you can play online for Sorry, free. Online, when, yeah. when NSO launched, it was, was it just, it was just online gameplay. There wasn't the mm -hmm. retro library, right? Well, it did launch alongside the retro library, but it was a pretty small one. So the price okay. was the same as it is now, $20 a year. It was, uh, it let you play online with friends and it gave you the access to classic titles and it started with an initial offering of 20 NES games, including like Super Mario Brothers, Super Mario Brothers 3, Legend of Zelda, you know, all the staples. And they've added stuff over the years since then. And one of the key features of the service is it allows you to play these games online with others through like an instanced gameplay session. Have you taken advantage of this? With the classic games? Yeah. No, I have not. Not at all. I, I mean, I'm a still, I'm a very solo gamer. So unless Same. it's local co-op in my house with my son... 
I'm not generally playing online with other people, but I love this. Tell me more. Yeah, so you can, it's basically as though they're sitting next to you on the couch. So any game that has like two player, you can jump online with them, right? Like, so like if you're playing Mario 3, you can have them basically be player two by joining your gameplay instance. I think originally you could just watch somebody play, but then eventually they added the ability to make it so that you could actually join and play alongside them. Whoa. That's a big thing for like the N64 library. That was like one of the big selling yeah. points. It's like you can play GoldenEye multi like online now because like, you know, it's just basically as though they're there playing it. And um, you could also use save states and rewind if you mess up. And I'll unashamedly admit to I still use that if I'm playing like a really challenging game. And then about a year later, on September 5th, 2019, Nintendo added the SNES to the library, initial offering of 21 games, including Zelda Link to the Past, Super Mario World, Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, Super Metroid. Again, a lot of staples. And then two years later, on October 25th, 2021, we got the Nintendo Switch Online Expansion Pack. And that was Ooh. priced at $50 a year, again, same as it is today gave you access to some expansions as well to modern games like Animal Crossing New Horizons, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, and Splatoon 2, as well as more classic game platforms. So this one initially featured Nintendo 64 and Sega Genesis. The N64 lineup initially featured nine games, including Ocarina of Time, Star Fox 64, Mario 64, and more. And the Genesis lineup featured 15 games, including Sonic 2, Streets of Rage 2, and Echo the Dolphin. So the big controversy here, Trisha, is that yes. you need to pay more to get access to these. So people are upgrading their thing because they love N64. Who doesn't? Sure, yep. But the emulation at that launch window for the N64 library was just downright bad. Like people were doing comparisons of like, here's oh. an emulator that I use on PC. And here's the emulation that I'm paying for on Switch. And it was yeah. like, this looks demonstrably worse. And yeah. not only that... But playing those games with any controller other than that, like, Switch N64 gamepad, where it's just, like, a wireless N64 controller, absolute nightmare. The only one that I found that isn't a disaster to try to play, like, using a traditional gamepad is Star Fox. And even that has some weird quirks to it. And that was sold out for a really long time. Like, Ugh. it was really – like, I have one now, but for, I want to say the first six months, it was really hard to get your hands on that one because of that – classic nintendo scarcity so um, you needed it yeah i mean now i have the nintendo switch uh retro controllers so that if mm -hmm. i want to play something retro i can play it with the appropriate controller but yeah i guess that's right i'm sure it was probably pretty hard to quite literally get your hands on yeah <laughs> uh, early on that totally makes sense it's not it never struck me as weird that people were paying more for more of the retro library because i thought not every gamer wants that Mm -hmm. But I'm glad it's available for the people who are. And for people that just need a small nostalgia boost, it's included with Nintendo Switch Online. So it never struck me as weird. But I mean, now that you're saying it like that, I'm like, I guess that is strange that certain games are paywalled more so well, it was, than others. It was more that they were asking people to bump up from $20 a year to $50 a year. And then like when they got to the N64, which is the big selling point, like, people love Sega Genesis. Mm -hmm. But N64 was like, oh, that's the one we've been waiting for. And then the emulation was shoddy. Like, that was the thing that a lot of people were upset about. It's like, you're asking me to pay more. I did that. And now you're giving me kind of like a worse product than if I were to just play this in the unauthorized way. Hint, hint. Um, so that was the big controversy. But then finally, we got a surprise in February of last year when Nintendo announced that Game Boy would be joining the base subscription. So the $20 a year mm -hmm. subscription and Game Boy Advance, another highly requested platform, was coming to the expansion pack. So Game Boy included nine games, and then Game Boy Advance included six games in its uh, initial offerings. And I will say that it is worth noting that all of these libraries have expanded dramatically since these initial yes. numbers. So as of now, there are 197 games included as part of the base subscription. That's just a base subscription. And a total of 291 games if you have the expansion pack, which is higher than both the 3DS and Wii U virtual console libraries, but way below the 398 available on the Wii virtual console. Wow. So we'll be getting into favorites in the, uh, in the final segment here, but was there a platform on Nintendo Switch Online that you spend the most time with? 
I mean the original NES. You're going to see really? it when we talk about our favorites. Um, and, and for me, because that's the console I had for years as mm-hmm. a kid. So like I said, everyone else was upgrading to Super NES, upgrading to Sega, upgrading to N64. And I played those games at my friends' houses. Mm-hmm. But then when I came home, I went back to my library of NES games because that's what I had. So the games that I most fondly remember beating time and time and time again were the NES cartridges. So for me now as an adult, that's what I return to quite often. Now, that's not to say that I don't discover games on Nintendo Switch Online or the expansion pass that I'm like, oh, I always wanted to play this and now I get a chance to. So that still happens. But for me, a lot of that is the nostalgia of it all. So I'll go back to games I remember fondly from my childhood. That was actually a perfect segue into my next question is, you know, it's such a nostalgia play to have these classic games. But are there any games that you experience for the first time, either through the virtual console or Switch Online? Yeah, um, a lot of the Zelda games, a lot of the classic really? Zelda games. Mm-hmm. You're such um, a diehard Zelda fan. I just assumed you were like playing them all as they came out. I, yeah, I had no way to do so that's fair, uh, that's fair. as a kid. I had no way to do so. I mean, it wasn't until college and my shout out to my part-time waitressing job at Applebee's uh, that I got enough money to scrimp together for my own video games. Turns out you um, were the one that was eating good in the neighborhood. hey oh, I was trying to. I was trying. Give me the tips on the endless, bottomless, boneless wings or whatever the heck the thing was at the time, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, so I I skinny together my tips and try to invest in console gaming. But I had been out of console gaming for so long that it was like, okay, am I, I'm coming back in at the PS2. I listed so like I missed the first PlayStation. I'm coming back, you know, like I'm I'm trying to come back in in this era when so much has happened that I had been PC gaming for so long uh, that I got, I missed out on a lot of that for me to complete is what I should say. So maybe mm-hmm. maybe this is where I got into my habit of starting a lot of games and not finishing them because <laughs> I would go to friends' houses or cousins' houses and like. I knew the cousin that had the Sega Genesis. I knew the cousin that had the N64. And when I went over their houses, that's what we did. Mm -hmm. But I never had the console to invest the time in on my own to get good. And you need to invest the the time for Zelda. You do. You absolutely do. Um, So I enjoyed what I played at other friends' houses. Um, But then, yeah, it took me being like, oh, man, that and Pokemon games. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I never, I was a, never a Pokemon fan because I never had a Game Boy. And by the time the Pokemon trading card games were popular, I was already playing Magic the Gathering. So I kind of like turned my nose up at Pokemon <laughs> cards a little bit. I was like, oh, it's like magic, but for kids, I get it. Um, and so I really like didn't give it the time of day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and now that my son has discovered Pokemon, it's really cute because I'm discovering it with him. Like, I'm getting to learn about Pokemon as he's learning about Pokemon. I'm getting to revisit the different regions that everyone else got to know years and years ago now for the first time. Um, And so that's been really fun, too. So, yeah, some of the Zelda games and all of the Pokemon library. Mm. So I'm constantly reaching out to my other friends like yourself, Brian, to be like, okay, we just finished Sword and Shield. Where are we going next? Uh, are we going Scarlet and Violet? Are we going Arceus? Like, what's the best move considering my son is six? We're playing together. Yeah, and it's it's been really interesting to get my kind of Nintendo diehard friends' opinions on that. Um, okay, but I'm just, well. I'm so grateful that it's there because people will say like, oh, well, you know, uh, certain games are better for younger kids. Certain games are better for older fans. What's your take on that? As far as which Pokemon game to go to? Yeah, for a seven-year-old. <sighs> You know, if he's played Sword and Shield... So Sword was the first game he ever rolled credits on by himself. Wow. Okay, so he's moved beyond, like, Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee. Okay, has he? Because I haven't played those, so I don't know. Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee is a little bit dumbed down in terms of, like, the mechanics. I love it because it's it's a more modern remake of, like, Red and Blue. Okay. Um, Or, I guess, Yellow more so because it's more about like the like pokemon yellow than it is red and blue but it's like you know it's kanto you're in kanto and you're okay you're replaying that story doing like the original eight gyms and everything and it's the 151 pokemon 
Um, it does have connectivity with Pokemon Go in some ways. Like you can transfer Pokemon from Pokemon Go to... Oh, well, that's interesting. And there is co-op to an extent. God, it's been so long since I've played that. But the thing is, is like the wild Pokemon encounters, there are still t- turn-based encounters if you're playing against another trainer. If you're battling another trainer, it's the turn-based gameplay. However, if you're wild Pokemon, it's this weird like motion control affair that you have to use the joy cons for and it's just not great okay good to know Um, scarlet and violet is one of the better pokemon games okay if you ignore the performance issues the performance issues are pretty dreadful i would say that pokemon legends arceus is the better game even if scarlet and violet is probably the better designed game and the game that flows better and is a much more traditional pokemon game okay pokemon legends arceus maybe has the most deceptive first hour because so that's what i had friends be like arceus is a little weird in the series i don't know that i'd go there next yeah it is weird it's going to be different um and the first hour or so is so painfully boring Mm, like it's very dialogue heavy like i was like oh i can't wait to play this it looks so great and then like when I was reviewing it, I was like, oh my god, I don't care. I don't care about anything these characters are saying. Like, just get to yeah. it. And then, like, once it dumped me out into the world, I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. Okay. Um, For right now, I just got the Sword DLC. Yeah, and that's he's probably DLCing a good bet. it up right there's now, two, and that's I think fine. there's two whole new regions, right? Yeah. Or like two- and so he, he totally finished one region. He's working on the second. So I'm like, okay, I need a place to go next, but... Uh, I mean, Scarlet and Violet is not a like it has a really bad reputation it's hard to go back to like if you've been playing like ps5 games like i I said on the Mm. show that like i reviewed mortal kombat 1 on ps5 which runs like butter right like it's so smooth and then i I tried to play the dlc for scarlet and violet and it like literally hurt my eyes because the frame rate is so bad (laughs) so i never got through it but like i had a blast with that like people give me so much crap because i gave it an 8.25 out of 10 when like the it really does have terrible performance but like the underlying game itself is so good and so okay. well made as long as he doesn't care about like oh the frame rate is dipping no, like I remember he, when i was a kid i didn't care he does not care about that at all like to feed the turn-based itch uh when the when super mario rpg uh just recently came out i was like okay great this is where we're gonna go next yeah so I mean, we did we did rpg um, and then he can jump into Paper Mario when Paper it comes Mario, out next Mario, yep, is, is next up on the agenda. And his platforming skills are starting to get there. So like Super Mario Brothers uh, Wonder and mm-hmm. Disney Illusion Island are okay. But in general, I found that he thrives in turn-based. Yeah. He doesn't love all the reading, but he's my strategy babe. Like he'll memorize all the Pokemon types and which type has advantage against this type. And yeah, he's my turn-based guy. I was so into Pokemon when I was, like, maybe a little bit older than him. I knew all... I mean, there was only 151 Pokemon at that point. But I knew all of the Pokemon numbers. Not just the names. Like, you could show me a Pokemon and I would be like, oh, that's number 37. That's hilarious. Good on you. I was all in on Pokemon. And I mean, I still still love Pokemon, so... My son made me buy the compendium book now that lists all the Pokemon that have ever been in any of the games (laughs) up till now. And we would read like three or four pages of it before bed every night. And I was like, it it basically reads like an encyclopedia. It's not a story at all. And I was like, you sure this this is what you want to read before bed? And he was like, mom, how else am I going to be a Pokemon master? Oh my God. I need to know them all. And I was like, okay, you know what? I can't argue with that. Here we go. Oh my God. He is so your son. (laughs) It's I met him too. Funny. I, I met your kid. I met your son at Nintendo Live. Uh, we we mm-hmm. were. I, I sat next to you and your family, and uh, we we sobbed openly when the some of the Zelda songs <laughs> you were played and by I the were orchestra. Crying, and my husband and my kid are like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, it was so funny. Yeah, you and I are like full on in tears at the Zelda orchestra. Um, but my son's cute moment at that is he saw the Triforce come up on screen. And he was like, oh, mommy, it's your necklace. Because he's never that. seen these games. Like Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild is way too difficult for him. We're not there yet. We're slowly introducing games, right? Yeah. But he, anything he sees Zelda, he's like, oh, mommy's game. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember like, you were yeah, being buddy. like, 
you were like, oh, do you think you're ready for this? Because this is like a bigger, like more <laughs> difficult game. It's like a lot bigger than like playing a Mario game or something like whatever, however you were comparing, like what he was yeah. playing at that point. And I was just like, oh, that's so cute. Like you coaching him through his, we're his gaming it. journey. I oh hope yeah. He- we started with Mario Party and Mario Kart for him mm-hmm. because Mario Kart with the auto accelerate and the steer assist. Yeah. Put it in a little wheel, put the Joy-Con in a little wheel, and then all they have to do is like motion control drive. Easy for kids. Mario Party, easy for kids. Um, you know, basic counting and punch in the air to roll the dice. We got this. Um, you know, so then from there, it's like, okay, what can we play next? Uh, where's where's the transition? And for him, like I have um, my nephew immediately got very drawn into Mario Maker. Oh, I love that. Mario Maker. And I'm like, okay, he's an engineer brain. I know I know what's happening in that brain. Uh, whereas my son, no patience for Mario Maker, but was like, Pokemon? Pokemon? Uh, and he's, so it's just, it's really interesting to see what different kids gravitate to or some kids that I have another, uh, my cousin's son, super into Legend of Zelda right away and like really good at it. And I was like, those games are not easy. Like, Killing it, my friend. Yeah. That's great. Um, but like I, I noticed my son had a hard time with um, reflexes, quick reflexes and hand-eye mm. coordination. So we played a lot of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Shredder's Revenge on oh, the Switch. so good. To help him get the idea of like, does it matter if you if your character dies, you'll just respawn. Not a big deal. Not like it's not the end of the universe. Just try again. Get up and try again. Get up and try again. And just getting him to move back and forth and press an action button. Mm-hmm back and forth action button and it's like okay now we're gonna do back and forth two action buttons an action and a jump can we handle that now it's gonna be back and forth and up and down action button jump can we handle that and just like slowly building that up Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah the gaming journey i'm finding it's really interesting because so many people like so many kids just the way that their little brains work are so different the way that they come into it but yeah it's been really funny seeing my son's journey for sure but we're, I think we're ready for another Pokemon. I think he's a little scared because he's like, no, I already beat champion Leon. I'm the champion. And so, like, he's scared to go to another region where he might not be champion and have to start at level one. Hey, you have to start from scratch, you know? But I'm like, buddy, this is how it works. So yeah, we'll you see. don't you don't carry into Final Fantasy 17 with all your stats from 16. <laughs> no, you do not. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's funny, your description of coaching your son through like his gaming journey reminds me of me coaching my dad because he, my dad is like largely responsible for me getting into gaming back like when I was a kid. And then when the N64 hit, he was like, I'm not learning how to hold this controller. I, it's too complicated. <laughs> to I'm be like, fair, I, it's a complicated controller. I was like, I get it. So he stopped playing video <laughs> games. And um, he, when COVID hit, he was like, I want to get like, a video game system. So I got, I told him to get, or no, this was before COVID. I, he wanted a VR system. And I was like, well, the PlayStation VR is going to be the one with the least amount of me, be, me being the tech support. Mm-hmm. So get a PSVR, get a PlayStation 4, you'll be great. And then my dad, like it came with Uncharted 4. So he's playing that. I got him Overwatch. So we played that, but like it was hilarious because he doesn't know how to Aww. use both sticks at the same time. So he would just run into the middle of a fight, stand in the middle of everybody shooting at each other, stay completely stationary, and then look where he wanted to shoot. And then he, that, it was very, very fun. Don't worry about it, Dad. I'm still like that with shooters. I have to stop. I can't move and aim at the same time. It's one or the other. So I have to like find a real good camping spot before I can even begin to think about aiming. He's been trying to get through God of War 2018 for about four years now. Um, <laughs> I've been coaching him through that when I can. That game's so good. It's unbelievable. <laughs> but... Uh, we are going to take our final break here, Trisha. And when we return, we'll be doing definitive ranking and getting your eShop gem of the week. We will be right back. We are back and it's time for Definitive Ranking, a recurring segment where we take a Nintendo topic and give our own personal top five lists. Since we spent today's main segment talking about the history of the Virtual Console and Nintendo Switch Online, Trisha, I want to get your top five classic games playing playable on Switch through Switch Online. So start at five, count it down to one, give me a quick sentence or two about each. Oh my goodness, I'm going to get razzed online for this so hard, but this list 
has changed in my mind at least three times since we just started talking today, Brian, just through the course of this episode, because I can't make up my mind and I'm very fickle. But I wanted to pick a list that didn't have any of the majors on it. So I intentionally didn't choose any Mario or Zelda games. So we'll have very little overlap then. Okay, good. We know they're good. We know they're good. You can go find them. I was trying to think of like games that maybe people haven't discovered yet. Ooh, okay. Some uh, if you have Nintendo, Nintendo Switch, Switch Online, Online gems. <laughs> yes, Nintendo Switch Online gems. Trying to pick like my top five not obvious picks, right? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go number five. I'm going with Golden Eye 007 for the N64. Awesome. Um, so good to revisit that. Whether you want to use the funky controller or not, totally up to you. Um, but a great one. Uh, then I'm going with Donkey Kong Country. Yes. Donkey Kong Country <laughs> was a game that I only got to play at my friend Amy's house. Shout out Amy uh, for the sleepovers where we played lots of Donkey Kong Country and it was amazing. Uh, so I'm putting that on as my number four. Number three is Excite Bike. Because mm. I still have a good time running some Excite Bike. I don't care who you are. That's a fun game. And it's not super easy. So put some hours in and get good, friends. That's Excite Bike. Uh, Kirby's Adventure is my number two. Because we still love Kirby to this day. That's And it's because of that game. Go back and Kirby's Adventure it up. So fun. And then my number one, and this is going to be my weirdest pick of all for my number one. Yoshi. For the NES. Ooh. The weird puzzle game, competitive puzzle game, Yoshi, is my number one pick. And now you asked me, Brian, if there was any other game I, I feel kind of competitive at. And I didn't mention this. And now I'm kicking myself because in addition to Paperboy speed running, which is a comp- competition I made up myself, but it's <laughs> well, fine. Pa- in you're addition saying to it Paperboy now, so it speed running, uh, Yoshi. I'm real good at Yoshi. And that, and part of that is probably because most people have not played that game. It's a real weird draw, <laughs> but I love it. And it is not friends that don't know what I'm talking about. It's not like Yoshi's Crafted World. No, it's not like a platformer starring Yoshi. No, no, this is like a Tetris slash Doctor Mario esque dropping puzzle game that can be competitive between player one and player two. And I believe that was his first appearance, right? I believe so. That was my first introduction to Yoshi. Was through this game. Well, wait, no, he debuted in Mario World, but then uh. I'm trying to see like this. Uh... Yeah, yeah, Wiki- Yoshi's a weird pull, but I'm like, look, if you haven't gotten a plan- chance to play it, just and you like, if you like puzzle games, you may not like puzzle games, and then it's not gonna be for you. But and you know what? Developed <laughs> by Pokemon developer Game Freak, I forgot about that. Oh. <laughs> Uh, but it was one of those cartridges that I got from a garage sale that nobody knew what it was. And then everyone was kind of like, wait, this is actually real good, though. Like, everyone yeah. that came over my house was like, this is real good, though. I was like, I know. Listen I got to it for this. $5 at a garage sale riding my bike. <laughs> Listen to this uh, <laughs> this stable of developers involved with Yoshi. Director Satoshi Tajiri, the creator of Pokemon. Producer, Shigeru Miyamoto. Producer, Sunikazu Ishihara, the president of Pokemon Company. I mean, obviously, all these are in the future. And then composer, (laughs) Junichi Masuda, a.k.a. the man in charge of Pokemon today and the composer of the first several Pokemon games. So there you go. Go check out Yoshi. That's a great pull. It really is. It's a weird pull. (laughs) It's a great one. It's a good puzzle game. Like, I've played that one before. I, Mm -hmm. I was... I knew there was a Yoshi game that was made by Game Freak, but I forgot if it was that or Yoshi's Cookie for SNES. But no, it was, in fact, Yoshi for NES. Yeah. We have one game that overlaps. Oh, I'm so excited. Because I did not abide by the no Mario, no Zelda rule. But which which Mario and Zelda games would be on your list if you did not abide by that? Oh, ma- oh I can't. I can't pick, like, one. <laughs> What a ho- what a horrible hard question! I know you did it too. You picked your top five too. I don't know. Um, do, uh, Zelda two, The Adventures of Link. What? Maybe? But I don't know. I'm, wow. I don't, I'm old school. I'm old school. But also like Mario Kart sixty four or Super Mario World or I don't know. There's so many. There's so many I can't pick. That's also part of why I was like, I can't put Zelda and Mario on this list. <laughs> well, it'll also dominate. Like last week yes. we did top five superhero games of all time. And it was Ooh. like, I could just put 
all the Spider-Man and Arkham games on here, and that would be I a mean, list. The Arkham games are great. Yeah, they're they're both so good. Those are two of my favorite franchises of all time. But like, it's like for the sake of having an interesting list, I limited myself, and that's what I did here. So, okay, number five, Donkey Kong Country. Ooh! So Donkey Kong Country is a really important game to me because my dad traveled a lot when when I was a kid. He traveled every single week. He would leave Monday morning, come back Thursday night. And when he would come home, we would play Super Nintendo. And it was either Mario World, Mario Kart, or Donkey Kong Country. And Donkey Kong Country was the one that we really bonded over. I mean, Mario Kart too. I, one of my fondest memories is my dad waking me up when I was like asleep on a school night at like probably one in the morning and he woke me up to tell me he beat rainbow road on 150 cc <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing yeah so but donkey kong country is the one that i think that like sticks out the most to us we still play it when i bring the switch home for uh when i visit them out in pennsylvania uh number four pokemon trading card game on game boy color because okay. it, there's no mainline pokemon games on switch online but pokemon trading card game is such a fun game it's a full-on RPG, but instead of catching Pokemon, you're collecting Pokemon cards. It's so good. Unbelievable. You're battling gyms. It's just, uh, it, it's fantastic. It's just a full-on Pokemon RPG, but you're collecting Pokemon cards. And it's like Yu-Gi-Oh meets Pokemon, essentially, if you want to, like, build out, like, a, a storyline there. It's so Maybe much fun. Maybe that's when I got to introduce to the kiddo. That that would be a good one. I mean, it's yeah. as long as he doesn't mind some outdated Game Boy Color graphics. Uh, we'll see. But yeah. <laughs> It, and it's the base set too, so like it's not a whole lot. It's not very overwhelming. Um, number three, Super Mario Advance Four, Super Mario Brothers Three, the most confusing title of all time. But the reason is Super Mario Brothers Three, one of the greatest games of all time, right? Mm -hmm. Facts. Super Mario Advance Four, the Game Boy Advance remake of Super Mario Brothers Three, adds exclusive e-reader levels that you could only get on the Game Boy Advance if you bought the e-reader and scanned special cards to obtain these levels, the Switch Online version and also the, the Wii U Virtual Console level has them all included as part of that because they know nobody's going to go out and buy an e-reader. So and they're also very hard to find now. Yeah. So you actually get exclusive new levels for Super Mario Brothers 3 in this version. So it's like, yeah. What are the new levels? I think there's like tens of new levels like, a, like dozens of new levels wow. designed by nintendo and apparently they're all very good i've only played a few of them and th those those were fun but like yeah they're all new levels created by nintendo in super mario brothers 3 amazing so yeah that's why that gets a spot on this list uh, over the mario all-stars version or over the nes version even though i do love the all mario all-stars package um number two legend of zelda ocarina of time like I said it before, it's my second yeah. favorite game of all time. Yeah. It's still so good to go back to. And then number one, I bet you can guess what it is. Super Mario World. It's just <laughs> my favorite platformer of all time. I've said it so many times. So good. But it's one of those games where you can just fire it up and you're immediately having fun. Yep. If I'm on a yep. plane and I want to play something simple, I fire that up on my Switch. Yep. And it's so good. It controls amazingly to this day. I, I think it's truly one of the most perfect games ever created. And it's a game that I still go back to when I'm just like craving something to play. That's what I play. Now you're inspiring me to introduce that game to my son. Hey, I, I bet he that would have a great fun. time. He That was the first Nintendo game I ever owned. I got that with my Super Aww. Nintendo under the Christmas tree. I guess it was behind the couch. It was like a, a Christmas story style, like Red Rider BB gun, only it was a Super Nintendo instead of a, a, a gun. So <laughs> I love this. I love this so much. All right, Trisha, that brings us to the final segment of today's episode. eShop Gem of the Week gives you a chance to shout out a game that you think deserves a little bit more shine on the Nintendo Switch eShop. What is your eShop Gem of the Week? I'm going with Celeste. A 2018 platformer from Maddie Makes Games. Um, I first got turned on to that indie studio from Towerfall. And mm -hmm. then was like, ooh, what else are they making? And I fell into this gem of an indie game called Celeste. Um, it is available on the Nintendo Switch eShop. And it's very, it, the platforming controls, I feel like, are very simple to pick up, but difficult to master. So it plays very well on the Switch. Um, and the story itself, the platforming does get very challenging. So putting it out there to anyone that's thinking about picking it up, if you don't like challenging platformers, you're going to have a hard time. That being said, they have some great accessibility settings for mm -hmm. folks that need extra help. 
Uh, but the platforming intentionally gets more challenging as you go because there's storytelling purposes that that aids very nicely. And I don't want to go into any more than that because I don't want to spoil it for anyone that hasn't played it yet. But it is a brilliant game. It looks beautiful. The soundtrack is am is amazing. Um, and yeah, I just I recommend it to anyone that hasn't picked it up yet. Absolutely. An amazing modern platformer with retro sensibility. Mm -hmm. Like you said, it's easy to control, but those levels get very, very challenging, especially if you're getting the collectibles. And um... I had to nope out on the collectibles pretty <laughs> early because I was like, there's just no way that's going to happen. And I'm in it for the story. Um, and the but story, I'm looking, yes. And right now on the eShop, it's $19.99. Yeah, it's... That's a win. It's definitely worth that $20. And... You know, I'm somebody who likes to use his platform to advocate for mental health. And Celeste has a fantastic story. Like you said, we're not going to spoil it, but it does do a great job of handling issues of mental health. And I very much recommend you pick this up. Um, fantastic platformer. Great pick. It came to Switch in 2018. And uh, yeah, if you haven't played it already and you love platformers, I mean, this is the next game you should play for sure. So Thanks so much for sharing that eShop gem of the week. And thank you for joining me for this episode of All Things Nintendo. Yes, thank you so much for having me. This is so lovely. I love that you have this show where you just get to chat about Nintendo, about Nintendo fandom, about Nintendo news. This is amazing. So I cannot wait to listen to all the future episodes. I know this show is still pretty early in its existence in its current form. In its current form, yes. In its current form. We'll see where it goes from here. Well, we're on episode 131 right now, so we are... We're, overall. Overall, but yeah, it's only the second episode since going independent. So you uh, you were very high on the list when I was like, all right, I'm taking the show independent. Who do I want to have on? I was like, well, Trisha, obviously. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to chat all things Nintendo with me. Thank you for having me. And thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Do me a favor, if you haven't already, throw All Things Nintendo a five-star review and hit that subscribe button. If you want to get any questions or comments in, you can get in touch with me at brian at allthingsnintendo.com or hit me up on social media at Brian Shea. You can also join the Game Informer Community Discord, which is a perk for subscribing to our Twitch channel, even just for one month. And a reminder that Game Informer now has a standalone subscription plan that you can get uh, your print issues delivered straight to your mailbox if you live within the United States. Ten issues shipped straight to your door for less than $20 before tax. Trisha, where can people find you online? Online, you can find me either at my full name, Trisha Hirschberger, on Twitch or YouTube, or at that girl Trish with no I in the girl. So it's just that GRL Trish on all the other social platforms. That is our show for this week. Thank you again for listening. Take care. We'll see you next time. <laughs>